83, 82, 83. Homer, Iliad, 24. 239, 240. A philosopher of Megara, and disciple of Socrates. Compare our author, De Fraterno Amore. So Reisk. Dubner reads Phi Beta Omicron Upsilon. The MSS. Have Phi Nu Omicron Upsilon, which Wittenbach retains, but is evidently not quite satisfied with the text. Can Phi Theta Nu Omicron Upsilon, Tau Epsilon Rho Omicron Nu be an account of Pi Iota Chi Alpha Iota Rho Epsilon Kappa Alpha Kappa Iota Alpha? Up in the clouds. CF Epsilon Rho Omicron Beta Alpha Tau Omega. Horace, remembering these lines no doubt, says, De Arte Poetica, 191, 192. Nec Deus intersit nisi dignus. Vindice notus insiderate. It is quite likely that the delicious poet Robert Herrick borrowed hence his, to starve thy sin not been, that is to keep thy lent. For we know he was a student of the Moralia, when at the University of Cambridge. See Aeschylus, Eumenides, 107. Sophocles, Oedipus Colonius, 481. See also our authors, De Sanite Precepta. Jeremy Taylor has closely imitated parts of this dialogue in his, Holy Living, Chapter 4. Sect. 8. 12 Remedies Against Anger, By Way of Exercise, 13 Remedies Against Anger, By Way of Consideration. Such a storehouse did he make of the, Moralia. On contentedness of mind. Plutarch sends greeting to Patius. It was late when I received your letter, asking me to write to you something on contentedness of mind, and on those things in the Timaeus that require an accurate explanation. And it so fell out that at that very time our friend Eros was obliged to set sail at once for Rome, having received a letter from the excellent Fundinus, urging haste according to his wont. And not having as much time as I could have wished to meet your request, and yet not thinking for one moment of letting my messenger go to you entirely empty-handed, I copied out the notes that I had chanced to make on contentedness of mind. For I thought that you did not desire this discourse merely to be treated to a subject handled in fine style, but for the real business of life. And I congratulate you that, though you have friendships with princes, and have as much forensic reputation as anybody, yet you are not in the same plight as the tragic Merops. Nor have you like him by the felicitations of the multitude been induced to forget the sufferings of humanity. But you remember, what you have often heard, that a patrician slipper is no cure for the gout, nor a costly ring for a whitlow, nor a diadem for the headache. For how can riches, or fame, or power at court help us to ease of mind or a calm life, unless we enjoy them when present, but are not for ever pining after them when absent? And what else causes this but the long exercise and practice of reason, which, when the unreasoning and emotional part of the soul breaks out of bounds, curbs it quickly, and does not allow it to be carried away headlong from its actual position. And as Xenophon advised that we should remember and honor the gods most especially in prosperity, that so, when we should be in any strait, we might confidently call upon them as already our well-wishers 290 and friends. So sensible men would do well before trouble comes to meditate on remedies how to bear it, that they may be the more efficacious from being ready for use long before. For as savage dogs are excited at every sound, and are only soothed by a familiar voice, so also it is not easy to quiet the wild passions of the soul, unless familiar and well-known arguments be at hand to check its excitement. He then that said, that the man that wished to have an easy mind ought to have little to do either public or private, first of all makes ease of mind a very costly article for us, if it is to be bought at the price of doing nothing. As if he should advise every sick person. Lie still, poor wretch, in. Bed. And indeed stupor is a bad remedy for the body against despair, nor is he any better physician of the soul who removes its trouble and anxiety by recommending a lazy and soft life and a leaving our friends and relations and country in the lurch. In the next place, it is false that those that have little to do are easy in mind. For then women would be easier in mind than men, since they mostly stay at home in inactivity, and even nowadays it is as Hesiod says. The north wind comes not near. A soft-skinned maiden. Yet griefs and troubles and unrest, 
proceeding from jealousy or superstition or ambition or vanity, inundate the women's part of the house with unceasing flow. And Laertes, though he lived for twenty years a solitary life in the country, with an old woman to attend on him, who duly set on board his meat and drink, and fled from his country and house and kingdom, yet had sorrow and dejection as a perpetual companion with leisure. And some have been often thrown into sad unrest merely from inaction, as the following. But fleet Achilles. Zeus sprung, son of Peleus, sat by the swiftly sailing ships and fumed, 291 nor ever did frequent th ennobling counsel, nor ever joined the war, but pined in heart, though in his tent abiding, for the fray. And full of emotion and distress at this state of things he himself says. A useless burden to the earth. I sit beside the ships. So even Epicurus thinks that those who are desirous of honor and glory should not rust in inglorious ease, but use their natural talents in public life for the benefit of the community at large. Seeing that they are by nature so constituted that they would be more likely to be troubled and afflicted at inaction, if they did not get what they desired. But he is absurd in that he does not urge men of ability to take part in public life, but only the restless. But we ought not to estimate ease or unrest of mind by our many or few actions, but by their fairness or foulness. For the omission of fair actions troubles and distresses us, as I have said before, quite as much as the actual doing of foul actions. As for those who think that one kind of life is especially free from trouble, as some think that of farmers, others that of bachelors, others that of kings, Menander sufficiently exposes their error in the following lines. Phania. I thought those rich. Who need not borrow, nor groan at nights. Nor cry out, woe is me, kicked up and down. In this untoward world, but sweet end. Gentle sleep they may enjoy. He then goes on to remark that he saw the rich suffering the same as the poor. Trouble and life are truly. Near akin. With the luxurious or the. Glorious life trouble consorts, and in the life of poverty lasts with it to the end. But just as people on the sea, timid and prone to sea sickness, think they will suffer from it less on board a merchantman than on a boat, and for the same reason shift their quarters to a trireme, but do not attain anything by these changes. For they take with them their timidity and qualmishness, so changes of life do not remove the sorrows and troubles 292 of the soul which proceed from want of experience and reflection, and from inability or ignorance rightly to enjoy the present. These afflict the rich as well as the poor, these trouble the married as well as the unmarried. These make people shun the forum, but find no happiness in retirement, these make people eagerly desire introductions at court, though when got they straightway care no more about them. The sick are peevish in their straits and needs. For the wife bothers them, and they grumble at the doctor, and they find the bed uneasy, and, as Ion says, the friend that visits them, tires their patience, and yet they do not like him to depart. But afterwards, when the illness is over, and a sounder condition supervenes, health returns and makes all things pleasant and acceptable. He that yesterday loathed eggs and cakes of finest meal and purest bread will today eat eagerly and with appetite coarsest bread with a few olives and cress. Such contentedness and change of view in regard to every kind of life does the infusion of reason bring about. When Alexander heard from Anaxarchus of the infinite number of worlds, he wept, and when his friends asked him what was the matter, he replied, Is it not a matter for tears that, when the number of worlds is infinite, I have not conquered one? But Crates, who had only a wallet and threadbare cloak, passed all his life jesting and laughing as if at a festival. Agamemnon was troubled with his rule over so many subjects. You look on Agamemnon. A true son, whom Zeus has plunged forever. In a mass of never-ending cares. But Diogenes when he was being sold sat down and kept jeering at the auctioneer, and would not stand up when he bade him, but said joking and laughing, would you tell a fish you were selling to stand up? And Socrates in prison played the philosopher and discoursed with his 293 friends. 
But Phaethon, when he got up to heaven, wept because nobody gave to him his father's horses and chariot. As therefore the shoe is shaped by the foot, and not the foot by the shoe, so does the disposition make the life similar to itself. For it is not, as one said, custom that makes the best life seem sweet to those that choose it, but it is sense that makes that very life at once the best and sweetest. Let us cleanse therefore the fountain of contentedness, which is within us, that so external things may turn out for our good, through our putting the best face on them. Events will take their course, it is no good our being angry at them, he is happiest who wisely turns them to the best account. Plato compared human life to a game at dice, wherein we ought to throw according to our requirements, and, having thrown, to make the best use of whatever turns up. It is not in our power indeed to determine what the throw will be, but it is our part, if we are wise, to accept in a right spirit whatever fortune sends, and so to contrive matters that what we wish should do us most good, and what we do not wish should do us least harm. For those who live at random and without judgment, like those sickly people who can stand neither heat nor cold, are unduly elated by prosperity, and cast down by adversity. And in either case suffer from unrest, but, tis their own fault, and perhaps they suffer most in what are called good circumstances. Theodorus, who was surnamed the Atheist, used to say that he held out arguments with his right hand, but his hearers received them with their left, so awkward people frequently take in a clumsy manner the favors of fortune. But men of sense, as bees extract honey from thyme which is the strongest and driest of herbs, so from the least auspicious circumstances frequently derive advantage and profit. We ought then to cultivate such a habit as this, 294 like the man who threw a stone at his dog, and missed it, but hit his stepmother, and cried out, not so bad. Thus we may often turn the edge of fortune when things turn not out as we wish. Diogenes was driven into exile, not so bad, for his exile made him turn philosopher. And Zeno of Sidium, when he heard that the only merchantman he had was wrecked, cargo and all, said, Fortune, you treat me handsomely, since you reduce me to my threadbare cloak and piazza. What prevents our imitating such men as these? Have you failed to get some office? You will be able to live in the country henceforth, and manage your own affairs. Did you court the friendship of some great man, and meet with a rebuff? You will live free from danger and cares. Have you again had matters to deal with that required labor and thought? Warm water will not so much make the limbs soft by soaking, to quote Pinder, as glory and honor and power make labor sweet, and toil to be no toil. Or has any bad luck or contumely fallen on you in consequence of some calumny or from envy? The breeze is favorable that will waft you to the muses and the academy, as it did Plato when his friendship with Dionysius came to an end. It does indeed greatly conduce to contentedness of mind to see how famous men have borne the same troubles with an unruffled mind. For example, does childlessness trouble you? Consider those kings of the Romans, none of whom left his kingdom to a son. Are you distressed at the pinch of poverty? Who of the Boeotians would you rather prefer to be than Epaminandus, or of the Romans than Fabricius? Has your wife been seduced? Have you never read that inscription at Delphi? Aegis the king of land and sea. Erected me. And have you not heard that his wife Timia was seduced by Alcibiades? and in her whispers to her handmaidens called the child that was born Alcibiades? Yet this did not prevent Agus from being the most famous and greatest 295 of the Greeks. Neither again did the licentiousness of his daughter prevent Stilpo from leading the merriest life of all the philosophers that were his contemporaries. And when Metricles reproached him with her life, he said, Is it my fault or hers? And when Metricles answered, Her fault, but your misfortune, he rejoined, how say you? Are not faults also slips? Certainly, said he. And are not slips mischances in those matters wherein we slip? Metricles assented. And are not mischances misfortunes in those matters wherein we mischance? By this gentle and philosophical argument he demonstrated the cynic's reproach to be an idle bark. But most people are troubled and exasperated not only at the bad in their friends and intimates, but also in their enemies. 
For railing and anger and envy and malignity and jealousy and ill will are the bane of those that suffer from those infirmities, and trouble and exasperate the foolish, as for example the quarrels of neighbors, and peevishness of acquaintances. And the want of ability in those that manage state affairs. By these things you yourself seem to me to be put out not a little, as the doctors in Sophocles, who with bitter physic purge the bitter bile. So vexed and bitter are you at people's weaknesses and infirmities, which is not reasonable in you. Even your own private affairs are not always managed by simple and good and suitable instruments, so to speak, but very frequently by sharp and crooked ones. Do not think it then either your business, or an easy matter either, to set all these things to rights. But if you take people as they are, as the surgeon uses his bandages and instruments for drawing teeth, and with cheerfulness and serenity welcome all that happens, as you would look upon barking dogs as only following their nature. You will be happier in the disposition you will then have than you will be distressed at other people's disagreeableness and shortcomings. For you will forget to make a collection of disagreeable things, which 296 now inundate, as some hollow and low-lying ground, your littleness of mind and weakness, which fills itself with other people's bad points. For seeing that some of the philosophers censure compassion to the unfortunate, on the ground that it is good to help our neighbors, and not to give way to sentimental sympathy in connection with them, and, what is of more importance. Do not allow those that are conscious of their errors and bad moral disposition to be dejected and grieved at them, but bid them cure their defects without grief at once, is it not altogether unreasonable, look you. To allow ourselves to be peevish and vexed, because all those who have dealings with us and come near us are not good and clever. Let us see to it, dear Patius, that we do not, whether we are aware of it or not, play a part, really looking not at the universal defects of those that approach us, but at our own interests through our selfishness. And not through our hatred of evil. For excessive excitement about things, and an undue appetite and desire for them, or on the other hand aversion and dislike to them, engender suspiciousness and peevishness against persons, who were, we think, the cause of our being deprived of some things, and of being troubled with others. But he that is accustomed to adapt himself to things easily and calmly is most cheerful and gentle in his dealings with people. Wherefore let us resume our argument. As in a fever everything seems bitter and unpleasant to the taste, but when we see others not loathing but fancying the very same eatables and drinkables, we no longer find the fault to be in them but in ourselves and our disease. So we shall cease to blame and be discontented with the state of affairs, if we see others cheerfully and without grief enduring the same. It also makes for contentedness, when things happen against our wish, not to overlook our many advantages and comforts, but by looking at both good and bad to feel that the good preponderate. When our eyes are dazzled with things too bright we turn them away, and ease them by looking at flowers or grass, while we keep the eyes of our mind strained on disagreeable things, and force 297 them to dwell on bitter ideas. Well nigh tearing them away by force from the consideration of pleasanter things. And yet one might apply here, not unaptly, what was said to the man of curiosity. Malignant wretch, why art so? Keen to mark thy neighbor's fault, and Sayest not thine own. Why on earth, my good sir, do you confine your view to your troubles, making them so vivid and acute, while you do not let your mind dwell at all on your present comforts? But as cupping glasses draw the worst blood from the flesh, so you force upon your attention the worst things in your lot, acting not a whit more wisely than that Chian, selling much choice wine to others. Ask for some sour wine for his own supper and one of his slaves being asked by another, what he had left his master doing, replied, asking for bad when good was by. For most people overlook the advantages and pleasures of their individual lives, and run to their difficulties and grievances. Aristippus, however, was not such a one, for he cleverly knew as in a scale to make the better preponderate over the worse. So having lost a good farm, he asked one of those who made a great show of condolence and sympathy, have you not only one little piece of ground, while I have three fields left? And when he admitted that it was so, he went on to say, Ought I not then to condole with you rather than you with me? For it is the act of a madman to distress oneself over what is lost, and not to rejoice at what is left. 
but like little children, if one of their many playthings be taken away by anyone, throw the rest away and weep and cry out, so we, if we are assailed by fortune in some one point. Wail and mourn and make all other things seem unprofitable in our eyes. Suppose someone should say, What blessings have we? I would reply, What have we not? One has reputation, another a house, another a wife, another a good friend. When Antipater of Tarsus was reckoning up on his deathbed his various pieces of good fortune, he did not 298 even pass over his favorable voyage from Cilicia to Athens. So we should not overlook, but take account of everyday blessings, and rejoice that we live, and are well, and see the sun, and that no war or sedition plagues our country, but that the earth is open to cultivation, the sea secure to mariners. And that we can speak or be silent, lead a busy or an idle life, as we choose. We shall get more contentedness from the presence of all these blessings, if we fancy them as absent, and remember from time to time how people ill yearn for health, and people in war for peace. And strangers and unknown in a great city for reputation and friends, and how painful it is to be deprived of all these when one has once had them. For then each of these blessings will not appear to us only great and valuable when it is lost, and of no value while we have it. For not having it cannot add value to anything. Nor ought we to amass things we regard as valuable, and always be on the tremble and afraid of losing them as valuable things, and yet, when we have them, ignore them and think little of them. But we ought to use them for our pleasure and enjoyment, that we may bear their loss, if that should happen, with more equanimity. But most people, as Arcesilius said, think it right to inspect minutely and in every detail, perusing them alike with the eyes of the body and mind, other people's poems and paintings and statues, while they neglect to study their own lives. Which have often many not unpleasing subjects for contemplation, looking abroad and ever admiring other people's reputations and fortunes, as adulterers admire other men's wives, and think cheap of their own. And yet it makes much for contentedness of mind to look for the most part at home and to our own condition, or if not, to look at the case of people worse off than ourselves, and not, as most people do. To compare ourselves with those who are better off. For example, those who are in chains think those happy who are freed from their chains, and they again freemen, and freemen citizens, and they again the rich, and the rich satraps, and satraps kings, and kings the gods. Content with hardly anything short of hurling thunderbolts and lightning. And so they ever 299 want something above them, and are never thankful for what they have. I care not for the wealth of. Golden Gyges. And. I never had or envy or. Desire to be a god, or love for mighty. Empire, far distant from my eyes are all. Such things. But this, you will say, was the language of Athasian. But you will find others, Chians or Galatians or Bithynians, not content with the share of glory or power they have among their fellow citizens, but weeping because they do not wear senators' shoes. Or, if they have them, that they cannot be praetors at Rome, or, if they get that office, that they are not consuls, or, if they are consuls, that they are only proclaimed second and not first. What is all this but seeking out excuses for being unthankful to fortune, only to torment and punish oneself? But he that has a mind in sound condition, does not sit down in sorrow and dejection if he is less renowned or rich than some of the countless myriads of mankind that the sun looks upon, who feed on the produce of the wide world. But goes on his way rejoicing at his fortune and life, as far fairer and happier than that of myriads of others. In the Olympian Games it is not possible to be the victor by choosing one's competitors. But in the race of life circumstances allow us to plume ourselves on surpassing many, and to be objects of envy rather than to have to envy others, unless we pit ourselves against a Briarius or a Hercules. Whenever then you admire anyone carried by in his litter as a greater man than yourself, lower your eyes and look at those that bear the litter. And when you think the famous Xerxes happy for his passage over the Hellespont, as a native of those parts did, look too at those who dug through Mount Athos under the lash. And at those whose ears and noses were cut off because the bridge was broken by the waves, consider their state of mind also, for they think your life and fortunes happy. Socrates, when he heard one of his friends saying, 
how 300 dear this city is. Qian wine costs one mina, a purple robe three, and half a pint of honey five drachmi, took him to the meal market, and showed him half a peck of meal for an abel, then took him to the olive market, and showed him a peck of olives for two coppers. And lastly showed him that a sleeveless vest was only ten drachmi. At each place Socrates' friend exclaimed, how cheap this city is. So also we, when we hear anyone saying that our affairs are bad and in a waffle plight, because we are not consuls or governors, may reply, our affairs are in an admirable condition, and our life an enviable one, seeing that we do not beg. Nor carry burdens, nor live by flattery. But since through our folly we are accustomed to live more with an eye to others than ourselves, and since nature is so jealous and envious that it rejoices not so much in its own blessings as it is pained by those of others. Do not look only at the much cried up splendor of those whom you envy and admire, but open and draw, as it were, the gaudy curtain of their pomp and show, and peep within, you will see that they have much to trouble them. And many things to annoy them. The well-known Pittacus, whose fame was so great for fortitude and wisdom and uprightness, was once entertaining some guests, and his wife came in in a rage and upset the table, and as the guests were dismayed he said. Every one of you has some trouble, and he who has mine only is not so bad off. Happy is he accounted at the forum, but when he opens the door of his own house thrice miserable, for his wife rules. All, still lords it over him, and is ever quarreling. Many griefs has he that I wot. Not of. Many such cases are there, unknown to the public, for family pride casts a veil over them, to be found in wealth and glory in even in royalty. O happy son of Atreus, child. Of destiny, blessed thy lot. Congratulation like this comes from an external view, from a halo of arms and horses and the pomp of war, but the inward voice of emotion testifies against all this vain glory. 301 inch a heavy fate is laid on me by Zeus the son of Kronos. And, old man, I think your lot one to be envied, as that of any man who free from danger passes his life unknown and in obscurity. By such reflections as these one may wean oneself from that discontent with one's fortune, which makes one's own condition look low and mean from too much admiring one's neighbors. Another thing, which is a great hindrance to peace of mind, is not to proportion our desires to our means, but to carry too much sail, as it were, in our hopes of great things and then, if unsuccessful, to blame destiny and fortune. And not our own folly. For he is not unfortunate who wishes to shoot with a plow, or hunt the hare with an ox. Nor has he an evil genius opposed to him, who does not catch deer with fishing nets, but merely is the dupe of his own stupidity and folly in attempting impossibilities. Self-love is mainly to blame, making people fond of being first and aspiring in all matters, and insatiably desirous to engage in everything. For people not only wish at one and the same time to be rich, and learned, and strong, and boon companions, and agreeable, and friends of kings, and governors of cities. But they are also discontented if they have not dogs and horses and quails and cocks of the first quality. Dionysius the Elder was not content with being the most powerful monarch of his times, but because he could not beat Philoxenus the poet in singing, or surpass Plato in dialectics. Was so angry and exasperated that he put the one to work in his stone quarries, and sent the other to Aegina and sold him there. Alexander was of a different spirit, for when Chryso the famous runner ran a race with him, and seemed to let the king outrun him on purpose, he was greatly displeased. Good also was the spirit of Achilles in Homer, who, when he said, None of the Achaean warriors is a match for me in war. 302 added. Yet in the council hall others there are who better are than me. And when Megabizus the Persian visited the studio of Apelles, and began to chatter about art, Apelles stopped him and said, While you kept silence you seem to be somebody from your gold and purple. But now these lads that are grinding colors are laughing at your nonsense. But some who think the Stoics only talk idly, 
in styling their wise man not only prudent and just and brave but also orator and general and poet and rich man and king, yet claim for themselves all those titles. And are indignant if they do not get them. And yet even among the gods different functions are assigned to different personages. Thus one is called the god of war, another the god of oracles, another the god of gain, and Aphrodite, as she has nothing to do with warlike affairs, is dispatched by Zeus to marriages and bridals. And indeed there are some pursuits which cannot exist together, but are by their very nature opposed. For example oratory and the study of the mathematics require ease and leisure. Whereas political ability and the friendship of kings cannot be attained without mixing in affairs and in public life. Moreover wine and indulgence in meat make the body indeed strong and vigorous, but blunt the intellect. And though unremitting attention to making and saving money will heap up wealth, yet despising and contemning riches is a great help to philosophy. So that all things are not within anyone's power, and we must obey that saying inscribed in the temple of Apollo at Delphi, know thyself, and adapt ourselves to our natural bent, and not drag and force nature to some other kind of life or pursuit. The horse to the chariot, and the ox to the plow, and swiftly alongside the ship scuds the dolphin, while he that meditates destruction for the boar must find a staunch hound. But he that chafes and is grieved that he is not at one and the same time, a lion reared on the mountains, exulting in his strength, and a little Maltese 303 lap, dog reared in the lap of a rich widow, is out of his senses. And not a whit wiser is he who wishes to be an Empedocles, or Plato, or Democritus, and write about the world and the real nature of things, and at the same time to be married like Euphorion to a rich wife. Or to revel and drink with Alexander like Medius. And is grieved and vexed if he is not also admired for his wealth like Ismenius, and for his virtue like Epaminandus. But runners are not discontented because they do not carry off the crowns of wrestlers, but rejoice and delight in their own crowns. You are a citizen of Sparta, see you make the most of her. So too said Solon. We will not change our virtue. For their wealth, for virtue never dies. But wealth has wings, and flies about from one man to another. And Strato the natural philosopher, when he heard that Menedemus had many more pupils than he had, said, Is it wonderful at all that more wish to wash than to be anointed? And Aristotle, writing to Antipater, said, Not only has Alexander a right to plume himself on his rule over many subjects, but no less legitimate is satisfaction at entertaining right opinions about the gods. For those that think so highly of their own walk in life will not be so envious about their neighbors. We do not expect a vine to bear figs, nor an olive grapes, yet nowadays, with regard to ourselves, if we have not at one and the same time the privilege of being accounted rich and learned, generals and philosophers, flatterers and outspoken, stingy and extravagant, we slander ourselves and are dissatisfied, and despise ourselves as living a maimed and imperfect life. Furthermore, we see that nature teaches us the same lesson. For as she provides different kinds of beasts with different kinds of food, and has not made all carnivorous, or seed pickers, or root diggers, so she has given to mankind various means of getting a livelihood, one by keeping sheep. Another by plowing, another by fowling, and another by catching the fish of the sea. 304 We ought each therefore to select the calling appropriate for ourselves and labor energetically in it, and leave other people to theirs, and not demonstrate Hesiod as coming short of the real state of things when he said. Potter is wroth with Potter. Smith with Smith. For not only do people envy those of the same trade and manner of life, but the rich envy the learned, and the famous the rich, and advocate sophists, aye, and freemen and patricians admire and think happy comedians starring it at the theatres. And dancers, and the attendants at king's courts, and by all this envy give themselves no small trouble and annoyance. But that every man has in himself the magazines of content or discontent, and that the jars containing blessings and evils are not on the threshold of Zeus, but lie stored in the mind, is plain from the differences of men's passions. For the foolish overlook and neglect present blessings, through their thoughts being ever intent on the future, but the wise make the past clearly present to them through memory. For the present giving only a moment of time to the touch, 
and then evading our grasp, does not seem to the foolish to be ours or to belong to us at all. And like that person painted as rope-making in Hades and permitting an ass feeding by to eat up the rope as fast as he makes it, so the stupid and thankless forgetfulness of most people comes upon them and takes possession of them. And obliterates from their mind every past action, whether success, or pleasant leisure, or society, or enjoyment, and breaks the unity of life which arises from the past being blended with the present. For detaching today from both yesterday and tomorrow, it soon makes every event as if it had never happened from lack of memory. For as those in the schools, who deny the growth of our bodies by reason of the continual flux of substance, make each of us in theory different from himself and another man, so those who do not keep or recall to their memory former things. But let them drift, actually empty them 305 selves daily, and hang upon the morrow, as if what happened a year ago, or even yesterday and the day before yesterday, had nothing to do with them, and had hardly occurred at all. This is one great hindrance to contentedness of mind, and another still greater is whenever, like flies that slide down smooth places in mirrors, but stick fast in rough places or where there are cracks. Men let pleasant and agreeable things glide from their memory, and pin themselves down to the remembrance of unpleasant things. Or rather, as at Olynthus they say beetles, when they get into a certain place called destruction to beetles, cannot get out, but fly round and round till they die, so men will glide into the remembrance of their woes. And will not give themselves a respite from sorrow. But, as we use our brightest colors in a picture, so in the mind we ought to look at the cheerful and bright side of things, and hide and keep down the gloomy, for we cannot altogether obliterate or get rid of it. For, as the strings of the bow and lyre are alternately tightened and relaxed, so is it with the order of the world, in human affairs there is nothing pure and without alloy. But as in music there are high and low notes, and in grammar vowels and mutes, but neither the musician nor grammarian decline to use either kinds, but know how to blend and employ them both for their purpose. So in human affairs which are balanced one against another, for, as Euripides says, there is no good without ill. In the world, but everything is mixed in. Do proportion. We ought not to be disheartened or despondent. But as musicians drown their worst music with the best, so should we take good and bad together, and make our checkered life one of convenience and harmony. For it is not, as Menander says, directly any man is born, a genius befriends him, a good guide to him, for life. But it is rather, as Empedocles states, two fates or genii take hold of each of us when we are born and govern us. There were Thonia and far-seeing Heliope, and cruel Dores, and grave Harmonia, and Callisto, and Escra, and 306 Thoosa, and Denia, and charming Nemertes, and Asaphia with the black fruit. And as at our birth we received the mingled seeds of each of these passions, which is the cause of much irregularity, the sensible person hopes for better things, but expects worse, and makes the most of either, remembering that wise maxim. Not too much of anything. For not only will he who is least solicitous about tomorrow best enjoy it when it comes, as Epicurus says, but also wealth, and renown, and power and rule, gladden most of all the hearts of those who are least afraid of the contrary. For the immoderate desire for each, implanting a most immoderate fear of losing them, makes the enjoyment of them weak and wavering, like a flame under the influence of a wind. But he whom reason enables to say to fortune without fear or trembling, If you bring any good I gladly welcome it, but if you fail me, little does it trouble me. He can enjoy the present with most zest through his confidence. An absence of fear of the loss of what he has, which would be unbearable. For we may not only admire but also imitate the behavior of Anaxagoras, which made him cry out at the death of his son, I knew I had begot a mortal, and apply it to every contingency. For example, I know that wealth is ephemeral and insecure. I know that those who gave power can take it away again, I know that my wife is good, but still a woman, and that my friend, since a human being, is by nature a changeable animal, to use Plato's expression. For such a prepared frame of mind, if anything happens unwished for but not unexpected, not admitting of such phrases as, I shouldn't have dreamed of it, or, I expected quite a different lot, or, I didn't look for this. 
abates the violent beatings and palpitations of the heart, and quickly causes wild unrest to subside. Carneades indeed reminds us that in great matters the unexpected makes the sum total of grief and dejection. Certainly the kingdom of Macedonia was many times smaller than the Roman Empire, but when 307 Perseus lost Macedonia, he not only himself bewailed his wretched fate, but seemed to all men the most unfortunate and unlucky of mankind. Yet Emilius who conquered him, though he had to give up to another the command both by land and sea, yet was crowned, and offered sacrifice, and was justly esteemed happy. For he knew that he had taken a command which he would have to give up, but Perseus lost his kingdom without expecting it. Well also has the poet shown the power of anything that happens unexpectedly. For Odysseus wept bitterly at the death of his dog, but was not so moved when he sat by his wife who wept, for in the latter case he had come fully determined to keep his emotion under the control of reason. Whereas in the former it was against his expectation, and therefore fell upon him as a sudden blow. And since generally speaking some things which happen against our will pain and trouble us by their very nature, while in the case of most we accustom ourselves and learn to be disgusted with them from fancy. It is not unprofitable to counteract this to have ever ready that line of Menander. You suffer no dread thing but in your fancy. For what, if they touch you neither in soul nor body, are such things to you as the low birth of your father, or the adultery of your wife, or the loss of some prize or precedence? Since even by their absence a man is not prevented from being in excellent condition both of body and soul. And with respect to the things that seem to pain us by their very nature, as sickness, and anxieties, and the deaths of friends and children, we should remember, that line of Euripides. Alas! And why alas? We only suffer what mortals must expect. For no argument has so much weight with emotion when it is borne down with grief, as that which reminds it of the common and natural necessity to which man is exposed owing to the body, the only handle which he gives to fortune. For in his most important and influential part he is 308 secure against external things. When Demetrius captured Megara, he asked Stilpo if any of his things had been plundered, and Stilpo answered, I saw nobody carrying off anything of mine. And so when fortune has plundered us and stripped us of everything else, we have that within ourselves which the Achaeans ne'er could rob us of. So that we ought not altogether to abase and lower nature, as if she had no strength or stability against fortune. But on the contrary, knowing that the rotten and perishable part of man, wherein alone he lies open to fortune, is small, while we ourselves are masters of the better part, wherein are situated our greatest blessings. As good opinions and teaching and virtuous precepts, all which things cannot be abstracted from us or perish, we ought to look on the future with invincible courage, and say to fortune. As Socrates is supposed to have said to his accusers Anatus and Melodus before the jury, Anatus and Melodus can kill me, but they cannot hurt me. For fortune can afflict us with disease, take away our money, calumniate us to the people or king, but cannot make a good and brave and high-souled man bad and cowardly and low and ignoble and envious, nor take away that disposition of mind, whose constant presence is of more use for the conduct of life than the presence of a pilot at sea. For the pilot cannot make calm the wild wave or wind, nor can he find a haven at his need wherever he wishes, nor can he await his fate with confidence and without trembling, but as long as he has not despaired, but uses his skill. He scuds before the gale, lowering his big sail, till his lower mast is only just above the sea dark as Erebus, and sits at the helm trembling and quaking. But the disposition of a wise man gives calm even to the body, mostly cutting off the causes of diseases by temperance and plain living and moderate exercise. But if some beginning of trouble arise from without, as we avoid a sunken rock, so he passes by it with furled sail, as Asclepiades puts it. But if some unexpected 309 and tremendous gale come upon him and prove too much for him, the harbour is at hand, and he can swim away from the body, as from a leaky boat. For it is the fear of death, and not the desire of life, that makes the foolish person to hang to the body, clinging to it, as Odysseus did to the fig tree from fear of Charybdis that lay below. Where the wind neither let him stay, or sail. 
so that he was displeased at this, and afraid of that. But he who understands somehow or other the nature of the soul, and reflects that the change it will undergo at death will be either to something better or at least not worse. He has in his fearlessness of death no small help to ease of mind in life. For to one who can enjoy life when virtue and what is congenial to him have the upper hand, and that can fearlessly depart from life, when uncongenial and unnatural things are in the ascendant, with the words on his lips. The deity shall free me. When. I will. What can we imagine could befall such a man as this that would vex him and wear him and harass him? For he who said, I have anticipated you, O fortune, and cut off all your loopholes to get at me, did not trust to bolts or keys or walls, but to determination and reason, which are within the power of all persons that choose. And we ought not to despair or disbelieve any of these sayings, but admiring them and emulating them and being enthusiastic about them, we ought to try and test ourselves in smaller matters with a view to greater. Not avoiding or rejecting that self-examination, nor sheltering ourselves under the remark, perhaps nothing will be more difficult. For inertia and softness are generated by that self-indulgence which ever occupies itself only with the easiest tasks, and flees from the disagreeable to what is most pleasant. But the soul that accustoms itself to face steadily sickness and grief and exile, and calls in reason to its help in each case, will find in what appears so sore and three ten dreadful much that is false, empty, and rotten as reason will show in each case. And yet many shudder at that line of Menander. No one can say, I shall not. Suffer this or that. Being ignorant how much it helps us to freedom from grief to practice to be able to look fortune in the face with our eyes open. And not to entertain fine and soft fancies, like one reared in the shade on many hopes that always yield and never resist. We can, however, answer Menander's line. No one can say, I shall not. Suffer this or that. For a man can say, I will not do this or that, I will not lie, I will not play the rogue, I will not cheat, I will not scheme. For this is in our power, and is no small but great help to ease of mind. As on the contrary. The consciousness of having. Done ill deeds. Like a sore in the flesh, leaves in the mind a regret which ever wounds it and pricks it. For reason banishes all other griefs, but itself creates regret when the soul is vexed with shame and self-tormented. For as those who shudder in ague fits or burn in fevers feel more trouble and distress than those who externally suffer the same from cold or heat, so the grief is lighter which comes externally from chance, but that lament. None is to blame for this but. I myself. Coming from within on one's own misdeeds, intensifies one's bitterness by the shame felt. And so neither costly house, nor quantity of gold, nor pride of race, nor weighty office, nor grace of language, nor eloquence, impart so much calm and serenity to life, as a soul pure from evil acts and desires. Having an imperturbable and undefiled character as the source of its life. Whence good actions flow, producing an enthusiastic and cheerful energy accompanied by loftiness of thought, and a memory sweeter and more lasting than that hope which Pindar says is the support of old age. Censors do not, as Carneades said, after they are emptied, long retain their sweet smell. But in the mind of the wise man good actions always leave a fresh and fragrant memory, by which joy is watered and flourishes, and 311 despises those who wail over life and abuse it as a region of ills, or as a place of exile for souls in this world. I am very taken with Diogenes' remark to a stranger at Lacedaemon, who is dressing with much display for a feast, does not a good man consider every day a feast? And a very great feast too, if we live soberly. For the world is a most holy and divine temple, into which man is introduced at his birth, not to behold motionless images made by hands. But those things, to use the language of Plato, which the divine mind has exhibited as the visible representations of invisible things, having innate in them the principle of life and motion, as the sun moon and stars, and rivers ever flowing with fresh water, and the earth affording maintenance to plants and animals. Seeing then that life is the most complete initiation into all these things, it ought to be full of ease of mind and joy. 
Not as most people wait for the festivals of Kronos and Dionysus and the Panathenia and other similar days, that they may joy and refresh themselves with bought laughter, paying actors and dancers for the same. On such occasions indeed we sit silently and decorously, for no one wails when he is initiated, or groans when he beholds the Pythian games. Or when he is drinking at the festival of Kronos, but men shame the festivals which the deity supplies us with and initiates us in, passing most of their time in lamentation and heaviness of heart and distressing anxiety. And though men delight in the pleasing notes of musical instruments, and in the songs of birds, and behold with joy the animals playing and frisking, and on the contrary are distressed when they roar and howl and look savage. Yet in regard to their own life, when they see it without smiles and dejected, and ever oppressed and afflicted by the most wretched sorrows and toils and unending cares, they do not think of trying to procure alleviation and ease. How is this? Nay, they will not even listen to others' exhortation, which would enable them to acquiesce in the present without repining, and to remember the past with thankfulness, and to meet the future hopefully and cheerfully without fear or suspicion. Or cheerfulness, or tranquility of mind. Jeremy Taylor has largely borrowed again from this treatise in his, Holy Living, ch. 2. Section 6, Of Contentedness in All Estates and Accidents. Reading with Salmasius Kappa Lambda Tau Iota Omicron Pi Alpha Tau Rho Kappa Iota Omicron. Locus Xenophontus Est Cyropod, L. I. Reisk. Euripides, Orestes, 258. So Wittenbach, Dubner. Volgo Nu Alpha Iota Sigma Theta Eta Sigma Alpha, Pi Omicron Nu Alpha. Works and Days, 519. Odyssey, I, 191. 192. I read Kappa Alpha Tau Eta Phi Epsilon Alpha Nu. Iliad, I, 488 to 492. Iliad, 18. 104. Euripides, Orestes, 232. Homer, Iliad, X, 88, 89. The story of Phaethon is a very well known one, and is recorded very fully by Ovid in the Metamorphoses, Book 2. Euripides, Bellerophon. Fragm. 298. Supplying Phi Upsilon Tau Nu with Risk. In Cyprus. Zeno was the founder of the Stoics. Zeno and his successors taught in the piazza at Athens called the Painted Piazza. See Pausanias, I, 15. Pinder, Nem. 4, 6. Euripides, Bacchi, 66. Quoted again by our author, on restraining anger. As will be seen, I follow Wittenbach's guidance in this very corrupt passage, which is a true crux. Reading Delta Epsilon Delta Omicron Rho Kappa Tau Epsilon. C. On Curiosity. Simonides. C. Herodotus, 7. 56. Amina was 100 drachmi, i.e. 4 pounds. 1s, 3d, and 600 obols. A slave's ordinary dress. One of the seven wise men. Homer, Iliad, 3. 182. Homer, Iliad, 2. 111. Words of Agamemnon to the house porter. Euripides, Iphigenia in Aulis, 17 19. Iliad, 18. 105. 106. C. Pausanias, X. 24. Pinder, Fragm, 258. Quoted, On Moral Virtue. Homer, Iliad, 17. 61, Odyssey, 6. 130. A famous breed of dogs from the island Melita, near Dalmatia. C. Pliny, History Nat, 3. 26, Extra. Section 30, Triple X. 5, Extra. Section 14. That non omnia possumus omnes. Pinder, Ism, I, 65 to 70. Hesiod, Works and Days, 25. Our, two of a trade seldom agree. An allusion to, Iliad, 24. 527 to 533. 
Ochnes. C. Pausanias, X. 29. So Wittenbach, who reads Delta Tau Omicron Tau Omega Nu. Reading Omicron Alpha with Risk. Homer to Wit. The Soul. The reading here is rather doubtful. That I have adopted is Risk's and Wittenbach's. Iliad, V. 484. Euripides, Bacchi, 498. Compare Horace, Epistles, I. 16. 78, 79. Reading with Dubner Rogamma Alpha Nu. Risk has Tau Omicron Nu Alpha Nu. Euripides, Orestes, 396. The Saturnalia, as the Romans called this feast, was well known as a festival of merriment and license. On envy and hatred. Outwardly there seems no difference between hatred and envy, but they seem identical. For generally speaking, as vice has many hooks, and is swayed hither and thither by the passions that hang on it, there are many points of contact and entanglement between them. For as in the case of illnesses there is a sympathy between the various passions. Thus the prosperous man is equally a source of pain to hate and envy. And so we think benevolence the opposite of both these passions, being as it is a wish for our neighbor's good, and we think hate and envy identical, for the desire of both is the very opposite of benevolence. But since their similarities are not so great as their dissimilarities, let us investigate and trace out these two passions from their origin. Hatred then is generated by the fancy that the person hated is either bad generally or bad to oneself. For those who think they are wrong naturally hate those who they think wrong them, and dislike and are on their guard against those who are injurious or bad to others, but people envy merely those they think prosperous. So envy seems illimitable, being, like ophthalmia, troubled at everything bright, whereas hatred is limited, since it settles only on what seems hostile. In the second place people feel hatred even against the brutes. For some hate cats and beetles and toads and serpents. Thus Germanicus could not bear the crowing or sight of a cock, and the Persian magicians kill their mice, not only hating them themselves but thinking them hateful to their god, and the Arabians and Ethiopians abominate them as much. Whereas we envy only human beings. Indeed among the brutes it is not likely that there should be any envy, for they have no conception of prosperity or adversity, nor have they any idea of reputation or 313 one of reputation, which are the things that mainly excite envy. But they hate one another, and are hostile to one another, and fight with one another to the death, as eagles and dragons, crows and owls, titmice and finches, insomuch that they say that even the blood of these creatures will not mix. And if you try to mix it it will immediately separate again. It is likely also that there is strong hatred between the cock and the lion, and the pig and the elephant, owing to fear. For what people fear they naturally hate. We see also from this that envy differs from hatred, for the animals are capable of the one, but not of the other. Moreover envy against anyone is never just, for no one wrongs another by his prosperity, though that is what he is envied for. But many are hated with justice, for we even think others worthy of hatred, if they do not flee from such, and are not disgusted and vexed at them. A great indication of this is that some people admit they hate many, but declare they envy nobody. Indeed hatred of evil is reckoned among praiseworthy things. And when some were praising Charillus, the nephew of Lycurgus and king of Sparta, for his mildness and gentleness, his colleague said, How can Charillus be good? who is not even harsh to the bad. And so the poet described the bodily defects of Thersites at much length, whereas he expressed his vile moral character most shortly and by one remark, he was most hateful both to Achilles and Odysseus. For to be hated by the most excellent is the height of worthlessness. But people deny that they are envious, and, if they are charged with being so, they put forward ten thousand pleas, saying they are angry with the man or fear him or hate him, suggesting any other passion than envy. And concealing it as the only disorder of the soul which is abominable. Of necessity then these two passions cannot, like plants, be fed and nourished and grow on the same roots, for they are by nature different. For we hate people more as they grow worse, but they are envied only the three fourteen more the more they advance in virtue. And so Themistocles, when quite a lad, 
said he had done nothing remarkable, for he was not yet envied. For as insects attack most ripe corn and roses in their bloom, so envy fastens most on the good and on those who are growing in virtue and good repute for moral character. Again extreme badness intensifies hatred. So hated indeed and loathed were the accusers of Socrates, as guilty of extreme vileness, by their fellow citizens, that they would neither supply them with fire, nor answer their questions, nor touch the water they had bathed in. But ordered the servants to pour it away as polluted, till they could bear this hatred no longer and hung themselves. But splendid and exceptional success often extinguishes envy. For it is not likely that anyone envied Alexander or Cyrus, after their conquests made them lords of the world. But as the sun, when it is high over our heads and sends down its rays, makes next to no shadow, so at those successes that attain such a height as to be over its head envy is humbled, and retires completely dazzled. So Alexander had none to envy him, but many to hate him, by whom he was plotted against till he died. So two misfortunes stop envy, but they do not remove hatred. For people hate their enemies even when they lie prostrate at their feet, but no one envies the unfortunate. But the remark of one of the sophists of our day is true, that the envious are very prone to pity. So here too there is a great difference between these two passions, for hatred abandons neither the fortunate nor unfortunate, whereas envy is mitigated in the extreme of either fortune. Let us look at the same again from opposite points of view. Men put an end to their enmity and hatred, either if persuaded they have not been wronged, or if they come round to the view that those they hated are good men and not bad, or thirdly if they receive a kindness. For, as Thucydides says, the last favor conferred, even though a smaller one, if it be seasonable, outweighs a greater offense. Yet the persuasion that they have not been wronged does not put an end to envy, for people envy although absolutely persuaded that they have not been wronged, and the two three fifteen other cases actually increase envy. For people look with an evil eye even more on those they think good, as having virtue, which is the greatest blessing. And if they are treated kindly by the prosperous it grieves them, for they envy both their will and power to do kindnesses, the former proceeding from their goodness, the latter from their prosperity, but both being blessings. Thus envy is a passion altogether different from hatred, seeing that what abates the one pains and exasperates the other. Let us now look at the intent of each of these passions. The intent of the person who hates is to do as much harm as he can, so they define hatred to be a disposition and intent on the watch for an opportunity to do harm. But this is altogether foreign to envy. For those who envy their relations and friends would not wish them to come to ruin, or fall into calamity, but are only annoyed at their prosperity. And would hinder, if they could, their glory and renown, but they would not bring upon them irremediable misfortunes, they are content to remove, as in the case of a lofty house, what stands in their light. Lambda Lambda Omega Mrs. Wittenbach Lambda Lambda Omega Nu. Malo Lambda Lambda Omicron Iota. So Wittenbach. Homer, Iliad, 2. 220. So Wittenbach. The reading in this passage is very doubtful. Thucydides, I, 42. Reading Pi Epsilon Sigma Tau Iota Nu Lambda Omega. Omicron Gamma Rho Phi Theta Omicron Nu Omicron Nu Tau Epsilon. What can be made of Pi Omicron Lambda Lambda Omicron here? How one can praise oneself. Without exciting envy. To speak to other people about one's own importance or ability, Herculanus, is universally declared to be tiresome and illiberal, but in fact not many even of those who censure it avoid its unpleasantness. Thus Euripides, though he says. If words had to be bought by human beings, no one would wish to trumpet his own praises. But since one can get word sans any payment from lofty ether, everyone delights in speaking truth or falsehood of himself, for he can do it with impunity, yet uses much tiresome boasting, intermixing with the passion and action of his plays irrelevant matter about himself. Similarly Pinder says, that, to boast unseason 316 ably is to play an accompaniment to madness, yet he does not cease to talk big about his own merit, which indeed is well worthy of encomium, who would deny it? 
but those who are crowned in the games leave it to others to celebrate their victories, to avoid the unpleasantness of singing their own praises. So we are with justice disgusted at Timotheus for trumpeting his own glory inelegantly and contrary to custom in the inscription for his victory over Phrynus, a proud day for you, Timotheus, was it when the herald cried out. The Milesian Timotheus is victorious over the son of Carbo and his Ionic notes. As Xenophon says, praise from others is the pleasantest thing a man can hear, but to others a man's self-praise is most nauseous. For first we think those impudent who praise themselves, since modesty would be becoming even if they were praised by others, secondly, we think them unjust in giving themselves what they ought to receive from others. Thirdly, if we are silent we seem to be vexed and to envy them, and if we are afraid of this imputation, we are obliged to heap praise upon them contrary to our real opinion, and to bear them out. Undertaking a task more befitting gross flattery than honor. And yet, in spite of all this, there are occasions when a statesman may venture to speak in his own praise, not to cry up his own glory and merit, but when the time and matter demand that he should speak the truth about himself. As he would about another. Especially when it is mentioned that another has done good and excellent things, there is no need for him to suppress the fact that he has done as well. For such self-praise bears excellent fruit, since much more and better praise springs from it as from seed. For the statesman does not ask for reputation as a reward or consolation, nor is he merely pleased at its attending upon his actions, but he values it because credit and character give him opportunities to do good on a larger scale. For it is both easy and pleasant to benefit those who 317 believe in us and are friendly to us, but it is not easy to act virtuously against suspicion and calumny, and to force one's benefits on those that reject them. Let us now consider, if there are any other reasons warranting self-praise in a statesman, what they are, that, while we avoid vain glory and disgusting other people, we may not omit any useful kind of self-praise. That is vain glory then when men seem to praise themselves that they may call forth the laudation of others, and it is especially despised because it seems to proceed from ambition and an unseasonable opinion of oneself. For as those who cannot obtain food are forced to feed on their own flesh against nature, and that is the end of famine, so those that hunger after praise, if they get no one else to praise them, disgrace themselves by their anxiety to feed their own vanity. But when, not merely content with praising themselves, they vie with the praise of others, and pit their own deeds and actions against theirs, with the intent of outshining them, they add envy and malignity to their vanity. The proverb teaches us that to put our foot into another's dance is meddlesome and ridiculous. We ought equally to be on our guard against intruding our own panegyric into others' praises out of envy and spite, nor should we allow others either to praise us then, but we should make way for those that are being honored. If they are worthy of honor, and even if they seem to us undeserving of honor and worthless, we ought not to strip them of their praise by self-laudation, but by direct argument and proof that they are not worthy of all these encomiums. It is plain then that we ought to avoid all such conduct as this. But self-praise cannot be blamed, if it is an answer to some charge or calumny, as those words of Pericles, and yet you are angry with such a man as me, a man I take it inferior to no one either in knowledge of what should be done, or in ability to point out the same, and a lover of my country to boot, and superior to bribes. For not only did he avoid all swagger and vainglory and ambition in talking thus loftily about himself, but he also x i 318 bided the spirit and greatness of his virtue, which could abase and crush envy because it could not be abased itself. For people will hardly condemn such men, for they are elevated and cheered and inspired by noble self laudation such as this, if it have a true basis, as all history testifies. Thus the Thebans, when their generals were charged with not returning home, and laying down their office of Beatarchs when their time had expired, but instead of that making inroads into Laconia, and helping Messini, hardly acquitted Pelopidas, who was submissive and suppliant, but for Epaminandus, who gloried in what he had done, and at last said that he was ready to die, if they would confess that he had ravaged Laconia, and restored Messini, and made Arcadia one state. Against the will of the Thebans, they would not pass sentence upon him, but admired his heroism, and with rejoicing and smiles set him free. So too we must not altogether find fault with Stenelus in Homer saying. 
we boast ourselves far better than our fathers. When we remember the words of Agamemnon, How now? Thou son of brave! Horse taming Tydeus, why dost thou crouch? For fear, and watch far off the lines of battle? How unlike thy father! For it was not because he was defamed himself, but he stood up for his friend that was abused, the occasion giving him a reasonable excuse for self commendation. So too the Romans were far from pleased at Cicero's frequently passing encomiums upon himself in the affair of Catalan, yet when Scipio said they ought not to try him, Scipio, since he had given them the power to try anybody, they put on garlands and accompanied him to the capital, and sacrificed with him. For Cicero was not compelled to praise himself, but only did so for glory, whereas the danger in which Scipio stood removed envy from him. And not only on one's trial and in danger, but also in misfortune, is tall talk and boasting more suitable than in prosperity. For in prosperity people seem to clutch as it were at glory and enjoy it, and so gratify their ambition. 319 But in adversity, being far from ambition owing to circumstances, such self-commendation seems to be a bearing up and fortifying the spirit against fortune, and an avoidance altogether of that desire for pity and condolence, and that humility. Which we often find in adversity. As then we esteem those persons vain and without sense who in walking hold themselves very erect and with a stiff neck, yet in boxing or fighting we commend such as hold themselves up and alert, so the man struggling with adversity. Who stands up straight against his fate, in fighting posture like some boxer, and instead of being humble and abject becomes through his boasting lofty and dignified, seems to be not offensive and impudent, but great and invincible. This is why, I suppose, Homer has represented Patroclus modest and without reproach in prosperity, yet at the moment of death saying grandiloquently. Had twenty warriors fought me. Such as thou, all had succumbed to my victorious spear. And Phocian, though in other respects he was gentle, yet after his sentence exhibited his greatness of soul to many others, and notably to one of those that were to die with him, who was weeping and wailing, to whom he said, What? Are you not content to die with Phocian? Not less, but still more, lawful is it for a public man who is wrong to speak on his own behalf to those who treat him with ingratitude. Thus Achilles generally conceded glory to the gods, and modestly used such language as, If ever Zeus shall grant to me to sack Troy's well-built town. But when insulted and outraged contrary to his deserts, he utters in his rage boastful words. Alighting from my ships. Twelve towns I sacked. And. For they will never dare to. Face my helmet when it gleams near. 320 For frank outspokenness, when it is part of one's defense, admits of boasting. It was in this spirit no doubt that Themistocles, who neither in word or deed had given any offense, when he saw the Athenians were tired of him and treating him with neglect, did not abstain from saying, My good sirs. Why do you tire of receiving benefits so frequently at the same hands? And, when the storm is on you fly to me for shelter as to a tree, but when fine weather comes again, then you pass by and strip me of my leaves. They then that are wrong generally mention what they have done well to those who are ungrateful. And the person who is blamed for what he has done well is altogether to be pardoned, and not censured, if he passes encomiums on his own actions, for he is in the position of one not scolding but making his defense. This it was that made Demosthenes' freedom of speech splendid, and prevented people being wearied out by the praise which in all his speech on the crown he lavished on himself. Pluming himself on those embassies and decrees in connection with the war with which fault had been found. Not very unlike this is the grace of antithesis, when a person shows that the opposite of what he is charged with is base and low. Thus Lycurgus when he was charged at Athens with having bribed an informer to silence, replied, What kind of a citizen do you think me, who, having had so long time the fingering of your public money. Am detected in giving rather than taking unjustly. And Cicero, when Metellus told him that he had destroyed more as a witness than he had got acquitted as an advocate, answered, Who denies that my honesty is greater than my eloquence? Compare such sayings of Demosthenes as, Who would not have been justified in killing me, 
had I tried in word only to impair the ancient glory of our city? And, what think you these wretches would have said, if the states had departed, when I was curiously discussing these points? And indeed the whole of that speech on the crown most ingeniously introduces his own 321 praises in his antitheses, and answers to the charges brought against him. However it is worth while to notice in his speech that he most artistically inserts praise of his audience in the remarks about himself, and so makes his speech less egotistical and less likely to raise envy. Thus he shows how the Athenians behaved to the Eubians and to the Thebans, and what benefits they conferred on the people of Byzantium and on the Chersonese, claiming for himself only a subordinate part in the matter. Thus he cunningly insinuates into the audience with his own praises what they will gladly hear, for they rejoice at the enumeration of their successes, and their joy is succeeded by admiration and esteem for the person to whom the success was due. So also Epaminandus, when Menaclides once jeered at him as thinking more of himself than Agamemnon ever did, replied, It is your fault then, men of Thebes, by whose help alone I put down the power of the Lacedaemonians in one day. But since most people very much dislike and object to a man's praising himself, but if he praises someone else are on the contrary often glad and readily bear him out. Some are in the habit of praising in season those that have the same pursuits business and characters as themselves, and so conciliate and move the audience in their own favor. For the audience know at the moment such a one is speaking that, though he is speaking about another, yet his own similar virtue is worthy of their praise. For as one who throws in another's teeth things of which he is guilty himself must know that he upbraids himself most, so the good in paying honor to the good remind those who know their character of themselves. So that their hearers cry out at once, Are not you such a one yourself? Thus Alexander honoring Hercules, and Androcotus again honoring Alexander, got themselves honored on the same grounds. Dionysius on the contrary pulling Gelan to pieces, and calling him the Gelos of Sicily, was not aware that through his envy he was weakening the importance and dignity of his own authority. 322 These things then a public man must generally know and observe. But those that are compelled to praise themselves do so less offensively if they do not ascribe all the honor to themselves, but, being aware that their glory will be tiresome to others, set it down partly to fortune, partly to the deity. So Achilles said well. Since the gods granted us to kill this hero. Well also did Timoleon, who erected a temple at Syracuse to the goddess of fortune after his success, and dedicated his house to the good genius. Excellently again did Pytho of Enos, when he came to Athens after killing Codes, and when the demagogues vied with one another in praising him to the people, and he observed that some were jealous and displeased, in coming forward and saying, Men of Athens, this is the doing of one of the gods, I only put my hands to the work. Sulla also forestalled envy by ever praising fortune, and eventually he proclaimed himself as under the protection of Aphrodite. For men would rather ascribe their defeat to fortune than the enemy's valor, for in the former case they consider it an accident, whereas in the latter case they would have to blame themselves and set it down to their own shortcomings. So they say the legislation of Zeleucus pleased the Locrians not least, because he said that Athene visited him from time to time, and suggested to him and taught him his laws, and that none of those he promulgated were his own idea and plan. Perhaps this kind of remedy by talking people over must be contrived for those who are altogether crabbed or envious, but for people of moderation it is not amiss to qualify excessive praise. Thus if anyone should praise you as learned, or rich, or influential, it would be well to bid him not talk about you in that strain, but say that you were good and harmless and useful. For the person that acts so does not introduce his own praise but transfers it, nor does he seem to rejoice in people passing encomiums upon him, but rather to be vexed at their praising him inappropriately and on wrong grounds. And he seems to 323 hide bad traits by better ones, not wishing to be praised, but showing how he ought to be praised. Such seems the intent of such words as the following, I have not fortified the city with stones or bricks, but if you wish to see how I have fortified it, you will find arms and horses and allies. Still more in point are the last words of Pericles. For as he was dying, and his friends very naturally were weeping and wailing, and reminded him of his military services and his power, and the trophies and victories and towns he had won for Athens, and was leaving as a legacy. 
he raised himself up a little and blamed them as praising him for things common to many, and some of them the results of fortune rather than merit, while they had passed over the best and greatest of his deeds and one peculiarly his own. That he had never been the cause of any Athenians wearing mourning. This gives the orator an example, if he be a good man, when praised for his eloquence, to transfer the praise to his life and character. And the general who is admired for his skill and good fortune in war to speak with confidence about his gentleness and uprightness. And again, if any very extravagant praise is uttered, such as many people use in flattery which provokes envy, one can reply. I am no god, why do you liken? Me to the immortals. If you really know me, praise my integrity, or my sobriety, or my kind-heartedness, or my philanthropy. For even envy is not reluctant to give moderate praise to one that deprecates excessive praise, and true panegyric is not lost by people refusing to accept idle and false praise. So those kings who would not be called gods or the sons of gods, but only fond of their brothers or mother, or benefactors, or dear to the gods, did not excite the envy of those that honored them by those titles. That were noble but still such as men might claim. Again, People dislike those writers or speakers who entitle themselves wise, but they wel 324 come those who content themselves with saying that they are lovers of philosophy, and have made some progress. Or use some such moderate language about themselves as that, which does not excite envy. But rhetorical sophists, who expect to hear, divine, wonderful, grand, at their declamations, are not even welcomed with, pretty fair, so-so. Moreover, as people anxious not to injure those who have weak eyes, draw a shade over too much light, so some people make their praise of themselves less glaring and absolute, by pointing out some of their small defects, or miscarriages, or errors. And so remove all risk of making people offended or envious. Thus Epius, who boasts very much of his skill in boxing, and says very confidently, I can your body crush, and break your bones. Yet says, Is not enough that I'm in. Fight deficient. But Epius is perhaps a ridiculous instance, excusing his bragging as an athlete by his confession of timidity and want of manliness. But agreeable and graceful is that man who mentions his own forgetfulness, or ignorance, or ambition, or eager desire for knowledge and conversation. Thus Odysseus of the Sirens. My heart to listen to them. Did incline, I bade my comrades by a nod to unloose me. And again of the Cyclops. I did not hearken, it had been far better, I wished to see the Cyclops, and to taste his hospitality. And generally speaking the admixture with praise of such faults as are not altogether base and ignoble stops envy. Thus many have blunted the point of envy by admitting and introducing, when they have been praised, their past poverty in straits, ay, and their low origin. So Agathocles pledging his young men in golden cups beautifully chased, ordered some earthenware pots to be brought in, and said, See the fruits of perseverance, labor, and bravery. Once I produced pots like these, but now golden cups. 325 for Agathocles it seems was so low-born and poor that he was brought up in a potter's shop, though afterwards he was king of almost all Sicily. These are external remedies against self-praise. There are other internal ones as it were, such as Cato applied, when he said, he was envied, because he had to neglect his own affairs, and lie awake every night for the interests of his country. Compare also the following lines. How should I boast? Who could? With ease have been enrolled among the many. In the army, and had a fortune equal to the wisest. And I shrink from squandering past labor's grace, nor do I now reject all present toil. For as it is with house and farm, so also is it with glory and reputation, people for the most part envy those who have got them easily or for nothing, not those who have bought them at the cost of much toil and danger. Since then we can praise ourselves not only without causing pain or envy but even usefully and advantageously, let us consider, that we may not seem to have only that end in view but some other also. If we might praise ourselves to excite in our hearers emulation and ambition. For Nestor, 
by reciting his battles and acts of prowess, stirred up Patroclus and nine others to single combat with Hector. For the exhortation that adds deed to word and example and proper emulation is animating and moving and stimulating, and with its impulse and resolution inspires hope that the things we aim at are attainable and not impossible. That is why in the choruses at Lacedaemon the old men sing. We once were young and vigorous and strong. And then the boys. We shall be stronger far then. Now we are. And then the youths. We now are strong, look at us. If you like. 326 In this wise and statesmanlike manner did the legislator exhibit to the young men the nearest and dearest examples of what they should do in the persons of those who had done so. Moreover it is not amiss sometimes, to awe and repress and take down and tame the impudent and bold, to boast and talk a little big about oneself. As Nestor did, to mention him again. For I have mixed air now with. Better men than both of you, and ne'er did. They despise me. So also Aristotle told Alexander that not only had they that were rulers over many subjects a right to think highly of themselves, but also those that had right views about the gods. Useful too against our enemies and foes is the following line. Ill-starred are they whose sons encounter me. Compare also the remark of Agesilaus about the king of the Persians, who was called great, how is he greater than me, if he is not also more upright? And that also of Epaminandus to the Lacedaemonians who were inveighing against the Thebans, anyhow we have made you talk at greater length than usual. But these kind of remarks are fitting for enemies and foes. But our boasting is also good on occasion for friends and fellow citizens, not only to abate their pride and make them more humble, but also when they are in fear and dejection to raise them up again and give them confidence. Thus Cyrus talked big in perils and on battlefields, though at other times he was no boaster. And the second Antigonus, though he was on all other occasions modest and far from vanity, yet in the sea fight off Kos, when one of his friends said to him, See you not how many more ships the enemy have got than we have? Answered, How many do you make me equal to them? This Homer also seems to have noticed. For he has represented Odysseus, when his comrades were dreadfully afraid of the noise and whirlpool of Charybdis, reminding them of his former cleverness and valor. We are in no worse plight. Then when the Cyclops. By force detained us. In his hollow cave, but even then, thanks. To my valor, judgment, and sense, we did. Escape. For such is not the self-praise of a demagogue or a sophist, or of one that asks for clapping or applause, but of one who makes his valor and experience a pledge of confidence to his friends. For in critical conjunctures the reputation and credit of one who has experience and capacity in command plays a great part in ensuring safety. As I have said before, to pit oneself against another's praise and reputation is by no means fitting for a public man, however, in important matters, where mistaken praise is injurious and detrimental, it is not amiss to confute it. Or rather to divert the hearer to what is better by showing him the difference between true and false merit. Anyone would be glad, I suppose, when vice was abused and censured, to see most people voluntarily keep aloof from it. But if vice should be well thought of, and honor and reputation come to the person who promoted its pleasures or desires, no nature is so well constituted or strong that it would not be mastered by it. So the public man must oppose the praise not of men but of bad actions, for such praise is corrupting, and causes people to imitate and emulate what is base as if it were noble. But it is best refuted by putting it side by side with the truth, as Theodorus the tragic actor is reported to have said once to Satyrus the comic actor, it is not so wonderful to make an audience laugh as to make them weep and cry. But what if some philosopher had answered him, to make an audience weep and cry is not so noble a thing as to make them forget their sorrows. This kind of self-laudation benefits the hearer, and changes his opinion. Compare the remark of Zeno in reference to the number of Theophrastus scholars, his is a larger body, but mine are better taught. And Phocian, when Leosthenes was still in prosperity, being asked by the orators what benefit he had conferred on the city, replied, only this, that during my period of office there has been no funeral oration. 
but all three twenty-eight the dead have been buried in their fathers' sepulchres. Wittily also did Crates parody the lines. Eating in wantonness and Love's delights are all I Value With Learning and those grand Things the muses teach one are all I Value Such self-praise is good and useful and teaches people to admire and love what is valuable and expedient instead of what is vain and superfluous. Let so much suffice on the question proposed. It remains to me now to point out, what our subject next demands and calls for, how everyone may avoid unseasonable self-praise. For there is a wonderful incentive to talking about oneself in self-love, which is frequently strongly implanted in those who seem to have only moderate aspirations for fame. For as it is one of the rules to preserve good health to avoid altogether places where sickness is, or to exercise the greatest precaution if one must go there. So talking about oneself has its slippery times and places that draw it on on any pretext. For first, when others are praised, as I said before, ambition makes people talk about themselves, and a certain desire and impulse for fame which is hard to check bites and tickles that ambition. Especially if the other person is praised for the same things or less important things than the hearer thinks he is a proficient in. For as hungry people have their appetite more inflamed and sharpened by seeing others eat, so the praise of one's neighbors makes those who eagerly desire fame to blaze out into jealousy. In the second place the narration of things done successfully and to people's mind entices many unawares to boasting and bragging in their joy. For falling into conversation about their victories, or success in state affairs, or their words or deeds commended by great men, they cannot keep themselves within bounds. With this kind of self laudation you may see that soldiers and sailors are most taken. To be in this state of mind also frequently happens to those who have returned from important posts and responsible duties, for in their mention of illustrious 329 men and men of royal rank they insert the encomiums they have passed on themselves. And do not so much think they are praising themselves as merely repeating the praises of others about themselves. Others think their hearers do not detect them at all of self-praise, when they recount the greeting and welcome and kindness they have received from kings and emperors. But only imagine them to be enumerating the courtesy and kindliness of those great personages. So we must be very much on our guard in praising others to free ourselves from all suspicion of self love and self recommendation, and not to seem to be really praising ourselves, under pretext of Patroclus. Moreover, that kind of conversation that mainly consists of censuring and running down others is dangerous as giving opportunity for self laudation to those who pine for fame. A fault into which old men especially fall, when they are led to scold others and censure their bad ways and faulty actions, and so extol themselves as being remarkably the opposite. In old men we must allow all this, especially if to age they add reputation and merit, for such fault-finding is not without use, and inspires those who are rebuked with both emulation and love of honor. But all other persons must especially avoid and fear that roundabout kind of self-praise. For since generally speaking censuring one's neighbors is disagreeable and barely tolerable and requires great wariness, he that mixes up his own praise with blame of another, and hunts for fame by defaming another, is altogether tiresome and inspires disgust, for he seems to wish to get credit through trying to prove others unworthy of credit. Furthermore, as those that are naturally prone and inclined to laughter must be especially on their guard against tickling and touching, such as excites the propensity by contact with the smoothest parts of the body. So those that have a great passion for reputation ought to be especially advised to abstain from praising themselves when they are praised by others. For a person ought to blush when praised, and not to be past blushing from 330 impudence, and ought to check those who extol him too highly, and not to rebuke them for praising him too little. Though very many people do so, themselves prompting and reminding their praisers of others of their own acts and virtues, till by their own praise they spoil the effect of the praise that others give them. For some tickle and puff themselves up by self-praise, while others, malignantly holding out the small bait of eulogy, provoke others to talk about themselves, while others again ask questions and put inquiries. As was done to the soldier in Menander, merely to poke fun at him. How did you get this wound? Sir, by a javelin. How in the name of? 
heaven. I was on a scaling ladder. Fastened to a wall. I show my wound to. Them in serious earnest, but they for their. Part only mock at me. As regards all these points then we must be on our guard as much as possible not to launch out into praise of ourselves, or yield to it in consequence of questions put to us to draw us. And the best caution and security against this is to pay attention to others who praise themselves, and to consider how disagreeable and objectionable the practice is to everybody, and that no other conversation is so offensive and tiring. For though we cannot say that we suffer any other evil at the hands of those who praise themselves, yet being naturally bored by the practice, and avoiding it, we are anxious to get rid of them and breathe again. Insomuch that even the flatterer and parasite and needy person in his distress finds the rich man or satrap or king praising himself hard to bear and well nigh intolerable. And they say that having to listen to all this is paying a very large shot to their entertainment, like the fellow in Menander. To hear their foolish saws, and soldier. Talk, such as this cursed braggart bellows. Fourth, kills me. I get lean even at their. Feasts. For as we may use this language not only about soldiers or men who have newly become rich, who spin us a long 331 yarn of their great and grand doings, being puffed up with pride and talking big about themselves. If we remember that the censure of others always follows our self-praise, and that the end of this vain glory is a bad repute, and that, as Demosthenes says, the result will be that we shall only tire our hearers. And not be thought what we profess ourselves to be, we shall cease talking about ourselves, unless by so doing we can bestow great benefit on ourselves or our hearers. Pinder, Olymp, 9. 57, 58. Mentioned by Pausanias, 3. 12, 8. 50. Memorabilia, 2. L, 31. Reading as Wittenbach suggests, mu lambda iota sigma tau alpha delta tau alpha nu lambda gamma eta tau alpha iota tau lambda lambda pi epsilon pyro alpha gamma mu nu alpha sq. Thucydides, 2. 60. C. Pausanias, 9. 14, 15. Homer, Iliad, 4. 405. Homer, Iliad, 4. 370, 371. Diomede. Sophocles, Trachinii, 442. Homer, Iliad, 16. 847, 848. Plutarch only quotes the first line. I have added the second for the English reader, as necessary for the sense. Homer, Iliad, I, 128, 129. Iliad, 9. 328. Iliad, 16. 70, 71. So Wittenbach. Demosthenes, De Corona. De Corona. After Wittenbach. After Wittenbach. That is, laughing stock. A play on the word Jelen. Homer, Iliad, 22. 379, he speaks of Hector. Others take it as fortune's favorite. Words of Demosthenes, the Corona. Plutarch condenses them. Homer, Odyssey, 16. 187. Titles of the Ptolemies, Philadelphus Philometer, Eurogetes. Homer, Iliad, 23. 673. Ibid, 670. Homer, Odyssey, 12. 192 to 194. Ibid, 9. 228, 229. Fragments from the Philoctetes of Euripides. Homer, Iliad, I, 260. 261. Homer, Iliad, 6. 127. Homer, Odyssey, 12. 209 to 212. An allusion to Homer, Iliad, 19. 302. Adopting the reading of Dubner. Adopting the reading of Salmasius. Nouveau riches, Novi homines. Demosthenes, de Corona. On those who are punished. By the deity late. 
A Discussion Between Patroclus, Plutarch, Timon, and Olympicus. When Epicurus had made these remarks, Quintus, and before any of us who were at the end of the porch could reply, he went off abruptly. And we, marveling somewhat at his rudeness, stood still silently but looked at one another, and then turned and pursued our walk as before. And Patroclus was the first to speak. Are we, said he, to leave the question unanswered, or are we to reply to his argument in his absence as if he were present? Then said Timon, because he went off the moment he had thrown his missile at us, it would not be good surely to leave it sticking in us. For we are told that Brasidas plucked the javelin that had been thrown at him out of his body, and with it killed the hurler of it. But there is of course no need for us to avenge ourselves so on those that have launched on us an absurd or false argument, it will be enough to dislodge the notion before it gets fixed in us. Then said I, which of his words has moved you 332 most? For the fellow seemed to rampage about, in his anger and abusive language, with a long disconnected and rambling rhapsody drawn from all sources, and at the same time invade against providence. Then said Patroclus, the slowness and delay of the deity in punishing the wicked used to seem to me a very dreadful thing, but now in consequence of his speech I come as it were new and fresh to the notion. Yet long ago I was vexed when I heard that line of Euripides. He does delay, such is the deity in nature. For indeed it is not fitting that the deity should be slow in anything, and least of all in the punishment of the wicked, seeing that they are not slow or sluggish in doing evil, but are hurried by their passions into crime at headlong speed. Moreover, as Thucydides says, when punishment follows as closely as possible upon wrongdoing, it blocks up the road at once for those who would follow up their villainy if it were successful. For no debt so much as that of justice paid behind time damps the hopes and dejects the mind of the wronged person, and aggravates the audacity and daring of the wrongdoer. Whereas the punishment that follows crime immediately not only checks future outbreaks but is also the greatest possible comfort to the injured. And so I am often troubled when I consider that remark of Bias, who told, it seems, a bad man that he was not afraid that he would escape punishment, but that he would not live to see it. For how did the Messenians who were killed long before derive any benefit from the punishment of aristocrats? For he had been guilty of treason at the Battle of the Great Trench, but had reigned over the Arcadians for more than twenty years without being found out, but afterwards was detected and paid the penalty, but they were no longer alive. Or what consolation was brought to the people of Orchomenus, who lost their sons and friends and relatives in consequence of the treason of 333 Lysiscus, by the disease which settled upon him long afterwards and spread all over his body. For he used to go and dip and soak his feet in the river, and uttered imprecations and prayed that they might rot off if he was guilty of treason or crime. Nor was it permitted to the children's children of those that were slain to see at Athens the tearing out of their graves the bodies of those atrocious criminals that had killed them, and the carrying them beyond their borders. And so it seems strange in Euripides using the following argument to deter people from vice. Fear not, for vengeance will. Not strike at once your heart, or that of. Any guilty wretch, but silently and with. Slow foot it moves. And when their times. Come will the wicked reach. This is no doubt the very reason why the wicked incite and cheer themselves on to commit lawless acts, for crime shows them a fruit visible and ripe at once, but a punishment late, and long subsequent to the enjoyment. When Patroclus had said thus much, Olympicus interfered, there is another consideration, Patroclus, the great absurdity involved in these delays and long-suffering of the deity. For the slowness of punishment takes away belief in providence, and the wicked, observing that no evil follows each crime except long afterwards, attribute it when it comes to mischance. And look upon it in the light more of accident than punishment, and so receive no benefit from it, being grieved indeed when the misfortune comes, but feeling no remorse for what they have done amiss. For, as in the case of a horse, the whipping or spurring that immediately follows upon a stumble or some other fault is a corrective and brings him to his duty. But pulling and backing him with the bit and shouting at him long afterward seems to come from some other motive than a desire to teach him, for he is put to pain without being shown his fault. 
So the vice which each time it stumbles or offends is at once punished and checked by correction is most likely to come to itself and be humbled 334 and stand in awe of the deity. As one that beholds men's acts and passions and does not punish behind time. Whereas that justice that, according to Euripides, steals on silently and with slow foot, and falls upon the wicked some time or other, seems to resemble more chance than providence by reason, of its uncertainty, delay, and irregularity. So that I do not see what benefit there is in those mills of the gods that are said to grind late, since they obscure the punishment, and obliterate the fear, of evil doing. When Olympicus had done speaking, and I was musing with myself on the matter, Timon said, Am I to put the finishing touch of difficulty on our subject, or am I to let him first contend earnestly against these views? Then said I, Why should we bring up the third wave and drown the argument, if he is not able to refute or evade the charges already brought? To begin then with the domestic hearth, as the saying is, let us imitate that cautious manner of speaking about the deity in vogue among the academic philosophers, and decline to speak about these things as if we thoroughly understood them. For it is worse in us mortals than for people ignorant of music to discuss music, or for people ignorant of military matters to discuss the art of war, to examine too closely into the nature of the gods and demons. Like people with no knowledge of art trying to get at the intention of artists from opinion and fancy and probabilities. For if it is no easy matter for anyone not a professional to conjecture why the surgeon performed an operation later rather than sooner, or why he ordered his patient to take a bath today rather than yesterday. How is it easy or safe for a mortal to say anything else about the deity than that he knows best the time to cure vice, and applies to each his punishment as the doctor administers a drug, and that a punishment not of the same magnitude? Or applied at the same time, in all cases? For that the cure of the soul, which is called justice, is the greatest of all arts is testified 335 by Pindar as well as by 10,000 others, for he calls God, the ruler and lord of all things, the greatest artificer as the creator of justice. Whose function it is to determine when, and how, and how far, each bad man is to be punished. And Plato says that Minos, the son of Zeus, was his father's pupil in this art, not thinking it possible that any one could succeed in justice, or understand how to succeed in it, without he had learned or somehow got that science. For the laws which men make are not always merely reasonable, nor is their meaning always apparent, but some injunctions seem quite ridiculous, for example, the ephors at Lacedaemon make proclamation, directly they take office. That no one is to let his mustache grow, but that all are to obey the laws, that they be not grievous to them. And the Romans lay a light rod on the bodies of those they make freemen, and when they make their wills, they nominate some as their heirs, while to others they sell the property, which, seems strange. But strangest of all is that ordinance of Solon, that the citizen who, when his city is in faction, will not side with either party is to lose his civic rights. And generally one might mention many absurdities in laws, if one did not know the mind of the legislator, or understand the reason for each particular piece of legislation. How is it wonderful then, if human affairs are so difficult to comprehend, that it is no easy task to say in connection with the gods, why they punish some offenders early, and others late. This is not a pretext for evading the subject, but merely a request for lenient judgment, that our discourse, looking as it were for a haven and place of refuge, may rise to the difficulty with greater confidence basing itself on probability. Consider then first that, according to Plato, God, making himself openly a pattern of all things good, concedes human virtue, which is in some sort a resemblance to himself, to those who are able to follow him. For all nature, being in disorder, got the principle of change and became order by a resemblance to and participation in the nature and virtue of the deity. The same Plato also tells us that nature put eyesight into us, in order that 336 the soul by beholding and admiring the heavenly bodies might accustom itself to welcome and love harmony and order, and might hate disorderly and roving propensities. And avoid aimless reliance on chance, as the parent of all vice and error. For man can enjoy no greater blessing from God than to attain to virtue by the earnest imitation of the noblest qualities of the divine nature. And so he punishes the wicked leisurely and long after, not being afraid of error or after repentance through punishing too hastily, 
but to take away from us that eager and brutish thirst for revenge. And to teach us that we are not to retaliate on those that have offended us in anger, and when the soul is most inflamed and distorted with passion and almost beside itself for rage, like people satisfying fierce thirst or hunger. But to imitate the mildness and long-suffering of the Deity, and to avenge ourselves in an orderly and decent manner, only when we have taken counsel with time long enough to give us the least possible likelihood of after repentance. For it is a smaller evil, as Socrates said, to drink dirty water when excessively thirsty, than, when one's mind is disturbed and full of rage and fury, before it is settled and becomes pure. To glut our revenge on the person of a relation and kinsman. For it is not the punishment that follows as closely as possible upon wrongdoing, as Thucydides said, but that which is more remote, that observes decorum. For as Melanthius says of anger, fell things it does when it the mind unsettles. So also reason acts with justice and moderation, when it banishes rage and passion. So also people are made milder by the example of other men, as when they hear that Plato, when he held his stick over his slave to correct him, waited some time, as he himself has told us, to compose his anger. And that Archidus, having learned of some wrong or disorderly action on the part of some of his farm laborers, knowing that at the time he was in a very great rage and highly incensed at them, did nothing to them, but merely departed, saying, You may thank your stars that I am in 337 a rage with you. If then the remembrance of the words and recorded acts of men abates the fierceness and intensity of our rage, much more likely is it that we, observing that the Deity, though without either fear or repentance in any case, yet puts off his punishments and defers them for some time, shall be reserved in our views about such matters, and shall think that mildness and long-suffering which the God exhibits a divine part of virtue, reforming a few by speedy punishment, but benefiting and correcting many by a tardy one. Let us consider in the second place that punishments inflicted by men for offenses regard only retaliation, and, when the offender is punished, stop and go no further. So that they seem to follow offenses yelping at them like a dog, and closely pursuing at their heels as it were. But it is likely that the Deity would look at the state of any guilty soul that he intended to punish, if haply it might turn and repent, and would give time for reformation to all whose vice was not absolute and incurable. For knowing how great a share of virtue souls come into the world with, deriving it from him, and how strong and lasting is their nobility of nature. And how it breaks out into vice against its natural disposition through the corruption of bad habits and companions, and afterwards in some cases reforms itself and recovers its proper position, he does not inflict punishment on all persons alike. But the incorrigible he at once removes from life and cuts off, since it is altogether injurious to others, but most of all to a man's own self, to live in perpetual vice, whereas to those who seem to have fallen into wrongdoing. Rather from ignorance of what was good than from deliberate choice of what was bad, he gives time to repent. But if they persist in vice he punishes them too, for he has no fear that they will escape him. Consider also how many changes take place in the life and character of men, so that the Greeks give the names Tauro Piomicron and Theta Omicron to the character, the first word meaning change, and the latter the immense force and power of habit. I think also that the ancients called Cecrops half man and half dragon 338 not because, as some say, he became from a good king wild and dragonlike, but contrarywise because he was originally perverse and terrible. And afterwards became a mild and humane king. And if this is uncertain, at any rate we know that Gelan and Hiero, both Sicilians, and Pisistratus the son of Hippocrates, though they got their supreme power by bad means, yet used it for virtuous ends. And though they mounted the throne in an irregular way, yet became good and useful princes. For by good legislation and by encouraging agriculture they made the citizens earnest and industrious instead of scoffers and chatterers. As for Gelan, after fighting valiantly in defeating the Carthaginians in a great battle, he would not conclude with them the peace they asked for until they inserted an article promising to cease sacrificing their sons to Kronos. And Lydiata was tyrant in Megalopolis yet in the very height of his power changing his ideas and being disgusted with injustice, he restored their old constitution to the citizens, and fell gloriously, fighting against the enemy in behalf of his country. 
And if anyone had slain prematurely Miltiades the tyrant of the Chersonese, or had prosecuted and got a conviction against Simon for incest with his sister, or had deprived Athens of Themistocles for his wantonness and revelings and outrages in the market, as in later days Athens lost Alcibiades, by an indictment, should we not have had to go without the glory of Marathon, and Euermedon, and beautiful Artemisium, where the Athenian youth laid the bright base of liberty? For great natures produce nothing little, nor can their energy and activity rust owing to their keen intellect, but they toss to and fro as at sea till they come to a settled and durable character. As then one inexperienced in farming, seeing a spot full of thick bushes and rank growth, full of wild beasts and streams and mud, would not think much of it. While to one who has learned how to discriminate and discern between different kind of soils all these are various tokens of the richness and goodness of the land, so great natures break out into many strange excesses. Which exasperate us at first beyond bearing, so that we think it right to cut off such offenders and 339 stop their career at once, whereas a better judge, seeing the good and noble even in these, waits for age and the season which nature appoints for gathering fruit to bring sense and virtue. So much for this point. Do you not think also that some of the Greeks did well to adopt that Egyptian law which orders a pregnant woman condemned to death not to suffer the penalty till after she has given birth? Certainly, said all the company. I continued, put the case not of a woman pregnant, but of a man who can in process of time bring to light and reveal some secret act or plan, point out some unknown evil, or devise some scheme of safety, or invent something useful and necessary. Would it not be better to defer his execution, and wait the result of his meditation? That is my opinion, at least. So we all think, said Patroclus. Quite right, said I. For do but consider, had Dionysius had vengeance taken on him at the beginning of his tyranny, none of the Greeks would have dwelt in Sicily, which was laid waste by the Carthaginians. Nor would the Greeks have dwelt in Apollonia, or Anactorium, or the peninsula of the Lucadians, had not Periander's chastisement been postponed for a long time. I think also that Cassander's punishment was deferred that Thebes might be repeopled. And of the mercenaries that plundered this very temple most crossed over into Sicily with Timoleon, and after they had conquered the Carthaginians and put down their authority, perished miserably, miserable wretches that they were. For no doubt the deity makes use of some wicked men, as executioners, to punish others, and so I think he crushes as it were most tyrants. For as the gall of the hyena and rennet of the seal, both nasty beasts in all other respects, are useful in certain diseases, so when some need sharp correction, the deity casts upon them the implacable fury of some tyrant. Or the savage ferocity of some prince, and does not remove the bane and trouble till their fault be got rid of and purged. Such a potion was Phalaris to the Agrigentines, and Marius to the Romans. And to the people of Sicyon the god distinctly foretold that their city needed a scourge, when they took away from the Cleonians, as if he was a Sicyonian, the lad Talicius, who was crowned 340 in the Pythian games, and tore him to pieces. As for the Sicyonians, Orthagoras became their tyrant, and subsequently Myro and Clisthenes, and these three checked their wanton outbreaks, but the Cleonians, not getting such a cure, went to ruin. You have of course heard Homer's lines. From a bad father sprang a son far better, excelling in all virtue. And yet that son of Caprius never performed any brilliant or notable action, but the descendants of Sisyphus and Autolycus and Phlegius nourished in the glory and virtues of great kings. Pericles also sprang of a family under a curse, and Pompey the Great at Rome was the son of Pompeius Strabo, whose dead body the Roman people cast out and trampled upon, so great was their hatred of him. How is it strange then, since the farmer does not cut down the thorn till he has taken his asparagus, nor do the Libyans burn the twigs till they have gathered the leadenum? That God does not exterminate the wicked and rugged root of an illustrious and royal race till it has produced its fit fruit. For it would have been better for the Phocians to have lost ten thousand of the oxen and horses of Iphidus, and for more gold and silver to have gone from Delphi, than that Odysseus and Aesculapius should not have been born. Nor those others who from bad and wicked men became good and useful. 
And do you not all think that it is better that punishment should take place at the fitting time and in the fitting manner rather than quickly and on the spur of the moment? Consider the case of Calippus, who with the very dagger with which he slew Dion, pretending to be his friend, was afterwards slain by his own friends. And when Midias the Argive was killed in a tumult, a brazen statue in the marketplace fell on his murderer and killed him during the public games. And of course, Patrocleas, you know all about Bessus the Paeonian, and about Aristo the Etian leader of mercenaries. Not I, by Zeus, said Patrocleas, but I should like to hear. Aristo, I 341 continued, at the permission of the tyrants removed the necklace of Eraphile which was hung up in this temple, and took it to his wife as a present. But his son being angry with his mother for some reason or other, set the house on fire, and burnt all that were in it. As for Bessus, it seems he had killed his father, though his crime was long undiscovered. But at last going to sup with some strangers, he knocked down a nest of swallows, pricking it with his lance, and killed all the young swallows. And when the company said, as it was likely they would, whatever makes you act in such a strange manner? Have they not, he replied, been long bearing false witness against me, crying out that I had killed my father? And the company, astonished at his answer, laid the matter before the king, and the affair was inquired into, and Bessus punished. These cases, I continued, we cite supposing, as has been laid down, that there is a deferring of punishment to the wicked. And, for the rest, I think we ought to listen to Hesiod, who tells us, not like Plato, who asserts that punishment is a condition that follows crime, that it is contemporaneous with it, and grows with it from the same source and root. For Hesiod says, Evil advice is worse to the Advisor And He who plots mischief, gainst Another brings it first on his own pate. The cantharis is said to have in itself the antidote to its own sting, but wickedness, creating its own pain and torment, pays the penalty of its misdeeds and not afterwards but at the time of its ill-doing. And as every malefactor about to pay the penalty of his crime in his person bears his cross, so vice fabricates for itself each of its own torments, being the terrible author of its own misery in life. Wherein in addition to shame it has frequent fears and fierce passions and endless remorse and anxiety. But some are just 342 like children, who, seeing malefactors in the theatres in golden tunics and purple robes with crowns on and dancing, admire them and marvel at them, thinking them happy. Till they see them goaded and lashed and issuing fire from their gaudy but cheap garments. For most wicked people, though they have great households and conspicuous offices and great power, are yet being secretly punished before they are seen to be murdered or hurled down rocks. Which is rather the climax and end of their punishment than the punishment itself. For as Plato tells us that Herodicus the Salimbrian having fallen into consumption, an incurable disease, was the first of mankind to mix exercise with the art of healing. And so prolonged his own life and that of others suffering from the same disease, so those wicked persons who seem to avoid immediate punishment, receive a longer and not slower punishment, not later but extending over a wider period. For they are not punished in their old age, but rather grow old in perpetual punishment. I speak of course of long time as a human being, for to the gods all the period of man's life is as nothing. And so to them, now and not thirty years ago, means no more than with us torturing or hanging a malefactor in the evening instead of the morning would mean. Especially as man is shut up in life as in a prison from which there is no egress or escape, and though doubtless during his life he has much feasting and business and gifts and favors and amusement, yet. Just like people playing at dice or drafts in a prison, the rope is all the time hanging over his head. And indeed what prevents our asserting that people in prison under sentence of death are not punished till their heads are cut off, or that the person who has taken hemlock, and walks about till he feels it is getting into his legs, suffers not at all till he is deprived of sensation by the freezing and curdling of his blood, if we consider the last moment of punishment all the punishment, and ignore all the intermediate sufferings and fears and anxiety and remorse. The 343 destiny of every guilty wretch. That would be arguing that the fish that has swallowed the hook is not caught, till we see it boiled by the cook or sliced at table. For every wrongdoer is liable to punishment, 
and soon swallows the pleasantness of his wrongdoing like a bait, while his conscience still vexes and troubles him. As through the sea the impetuous tunny darts. For the recklessness and audacity of vice is strong and rampant till the crime is committed, but afterwards, when the passion subsides like a storm, it becomes timid and dejected and a prey to fears and superstitions. So that Stasichorus in his account of Clytemnestra's dream may have represented the facts and real state of the case, where he says, a dragon seemed to appear to her with its lofty head smeared all over with blood. And out of it seemed to come King Orestes the grandson of Plisthenes. For visions in dreams, and apparitions during the day, and oracles, and lightning, and whatever is thought to come from the deity, bring tempests of apprehension to the guilty. So they say that one time Apollodorus in a dream saw himself flayed by the Scythians, and then boiled, and that his heart out of the cauldron spoke to him in a low voice and said, I am the cause of this. And at another time he dreamed that he saw his daughters running round him in a circle all on fire and in flames. And Hipparchus the son of Pisistratus, a little before his death, dreamt that Aphrodite threw some blood on his face out of a certain phial. And the friends of Ptolemy Serranus dreamed that he was summoned for trial by Seleucus, and that the judges were vultures and wolves, who tore his flesh and distributed it wholesale among his enemies. And Pausanias at Byzantium, having sent for Cleonice a freeborn maiden, intending to outrage her and pass the night with her, being seized with some alarm or suspicion killed her, and frequently saw her in his dream saying to him, Come near for judgment, lust is most assuredly a grievous bane to men, and as this apparition did not cease, he sailed, it seems, to Heraclea to the place where the souls of the dead could be summoned. And by propitiations and sacrifices called up the soul of the maiden, and she appeared to him 344 and told him that this trouble would end when he got to Lacedaemon, and directly he got there he died. And so, if nothing happens to the soul after death, but that event is the end of all enjoyment or punishment, one would be rather inclined to say that the deity was lax and indulgent in quickly punishing the wicked and depriving them of life. For even if we were to say that the wicked had no other trouble in a long life, yet, when their wrongdoing was proved to bring them no profit or enjoyment, no good or adequate return for their many and great anxieties. The consciousness of that would be quite enough to throw their mind off its balance. So they record of Lysimachus that he was so overcome by thirst that he surrendered himself and his forces to the Gedi for some drink, but after he had drunk and bethought him that he was now a captive, he said, Alas! How guilty am I for so brief a gratification to lose so great a kingdom! And yet it is very difficult to resist a necessity of nature. But when a man, either for the love of money, or for political place or power, or carried away by some amorous propensity, does some lawless and dreadful deed, and, after his eager desire, is satisfied. Sees in process of time that only the base and terrible elements of his crime remain, while nothing useful, or necessary, or advantageous has flowed from it, is it not likely that the idea would often present itself to him that, moved by vainglory, or for some illiberal and unlovely pleasure, he had violated the greatest and noblest rights of mankind, and had filled his life with shame and trouble. For as Simonides used to say playfully that he always found his money chest full but his gratitude chest empty, so the wicked contemplating their own vice soon find out that their gratification is joyless and hopeless. And ever attended by fears and griefs and gloomy memories, and suspicions about the future, and distrust about the present. Thus we hear Eno, repenting for what she had done, saying on the stage. 345 Dear women, would that. I could now inhabit for the first time the house of Athamas, guiltless of any of my awful deeds. It is likely that the soul of every wicked person will meditate in this way, and consider how it can escape the memory of its ill deeds, and lay its conscience to sleep, and become pure, and live another life over again from the beginning. For there is no confidence, or reality, or continuance, or security, in what wickedness proposes to itself, unless by Zeus we shall say that evildoers are wise. But wherever the greedy love of wealth or pleasure or violent envy dwells with hatred and malignity, there will you also see and find station superstition, and remissness for labor, and cowardice in respect to death. 
and sudden caprice in the passions, and vainglory and boasting. Those that censure them frighten them, and they even fear those that praise them as wronged by their deceit, and as most hostile to the bad because they readily praise those they think good. For as in the case of ill-tempered steel the hardness of vice is rotten, and its strength easily shattered. So that in course of time, understanding their real selves, they are vexed and disgusted with their past life and abhor it. For if a bad man who restores property entrusted to his care, or becomes surety for a friend, or contributes very generously and liberally to his country out of love of glory or honor, at once repents and is sorry for what he has done from the fickleness and changeableness of his mind. And if men applauded in the theatres directly afterwards groan, their love of glory subsiding into love of money. Shall we suppose that those who sacrificed men to tyrannies and conspiracies as Apollodorus did, or that those who robbed their friends of money as Glaucus the son of Episides did, never repented, or loathed themselves? Or regretted their past misdeeds? For my part, if it is lawful to say so, I do not think evil doers need any god or man to punish them, for the marring and troubling of all their life by vice is in itself adequate punishment. But consider now whether I have not spoken too long. Then Timon said, Perhaps you have, considering 346 what remains and the time it will take. For now I am going to start the last question, as if it were a combatant in reserve, since the other two questions have been debated sufficiently. For as to the charge and bold accusation that Euripides brings against the gods, for visiting the sins of the parents upon the children, consider that even those of us who are silent agree with Euripides. For if the guilty were punished themselves there would be no further need to punish the innocent, for it is not fair to punish even the guilty twice for the same offence, whereas if the gods through easiness remit the punishment of the wicked. And exact it later on from the innocent, they do not well to compensate for their tardiness by injustice. Such conduct resembles the story told of Aesop's coming to this very spot, with money from Croesus, to offer a splendid sacrifice to the god, and to give four minae to each of the Delphians. And some quarrel or difference belike ensuing between him and the Delphians here, he offered the sacrifice, but sent the money back to Sardis, as though the Delphians were not worthy to receive that benefit. So they fabricated against him a charge of sacrilege, and put him to death by throwing him headlong down yonder rock called Hyampia. And in consequence the god is said to have been wroth with them, and to have brought dearth on their land, and all kinds of strange diseases, so that they went round at the public festivals of the Greeks. And invited by proclamation whoever wished to take satisfaction of them for Aesop's death. And three generations afterwards came Idman a Samian, no relation of Aesop's, but a descendant of those who had purchased Aesop as a slave at Samos, and by giving him satisfaction the Delphians got rid of their trouble. And it was in consequence of this, they say, that the punishment of those guilty of sacrilege was transferred from Hyampia to Noplia. And even great lovers of Alexander, as we are, do not praise his destroying the city of the Brancidae and putting everybody in it to death because their great-grandfathers betrayed the 347 temple at Miletus. And Agathocles, the tyrant of Syracuse, laughing and jeering at the Corsarians for asking him why he wasted their island, replied, Because, by Zeus, your forefathers welcomed Odysseus. And when the people of Ithaca likewise complained of his soldiers carrying off their sheep, he said, Your king came to us, and actually put out the shepherd's eye to boot. And is it not stranger still in Apollo punishing the present inhabitants of Phineas, by damming up the channel dug to carry off their water, and so flooding the whole of their district, because a thousand years ago, they say. Hercules carried off to Phineas the oracular tripod. And in telling the Sybarites that the only end of their troubles would be propitiating by their ruin on three occasions the wrath of Lucadian Hera. And indeed it is no long time since the Locrians have ceased sending maidens to Troy who without upper garments, and barefooted, like slave girls, in the early morning swept around Athene's altar, all unveiled, till old age came upon them, with its burdens, all because Ajax violated Cassandra. Where is the reason or justice in all this? Nor do we praise the Thracians who to this day, in honor of Orpheus, mark their wives, 
nor the barbarians on the banks of the Eridanus who, they say, were mourning for Phaethon. And I think it would be still more ridiculous if the people living at the time Phaethon perished had neglected him, and those who lived five or ten generations after his tragic death had begun the practice of wearing mourning and grieving for him. And yet this would be only folly, there would be nothing dreadful or fatal about it, but what should make the anger of the god subside at once and then afterwards, like some rivers, burst out against others till they completely ruin them? 348 Directly he left off, fearing that if he began again he would introduce more and greater absurdities, I asked him, well, do you believe all this to be true? And he replied, if not all, but only some, of it is true, do you not think that the subject presents the same difficulty? Perhaps, said I, it is as with those in a raging fever, whether they have few or many clothes on the bed they are equally hot or nearly so, yet to ease them we shall do well to remove some of the clothes. But let us waive this point, if you don't like the line of argument, though a good deal of what you have said seems myth and fable, and let us recall to our minds the recent festival in honor of Apollo called Theoxenia. And the noble share in it which the heralds expressly reserved for the descendants of Pindar, and how grand and pleasant it seemed to you. Who could help being pleased, said he, with such a delightful honor, so Greek and breathing the simple spirit of antiquity, had he not, to use Pindar's own phrase, a black heart forged when the flame was cold. I pass over then, said I, the similar proclamation at Sparta, after the lesbian singer, in honor and memory of old Terpander, for it is a similar case. But you yourselves certainly lay claim to be better than other Boeotians as descended from Opheltes, and than other Phocians because of your ancestor Diphantus. And you were the first to give me help and assistance in preserving for the Lycormi and Satellae their hereditary privilege of wearing crowns as descendants of Hercules. When I contended that we ought to confirm the honors and favors of the descendants of Hercules more especially because, though he was such a benefactor to the Greeks, he had had himself no adequate favor or return. You remind me, he said, of a noble effort, and one well worthy of a philosopher. Dismiss then, said I, my dear fellow, your vehement accusation against the gods, and do not be so vexed that some of a bad or evil stock are punished by them, or else do not joy in and approve of the honor paid to descent 349 from a good stock. For it is unreasonable, if we continue to show favor to a virtuous stock, to think punishment wrong in the case of a criminal stock, or that it should not correspond with the adequate reward of merit. And he that is glad to see the descendants of Simon honored at Athens, but is displeased and indignant that the descendants of Lachers or Aristo are in exile, is too soft and easy, or rather too fault-finding and peevish with the gods. Accusing them if the descendants of a bad and wicked man are fortunate, and accusing them also if the progeny of the bad are wiped off the face of the earth. Thus finding fault with the deity alike, whether the descendants of the good or bad father are unfortunate. Let these remarks, I continued, be your bulwarks as it were against those excessively bitter and railing accusations. And taking up again as it were the initial clue to our subject, which as it is about the deity is dark and full of mazes and labyrinths, let us warily and calmly follow the track to what is probable and plausible. For certainty and truth are things very difficult to find even in everyday life. For example, why are the children of those that have died of consumption or dropsy bidden to sit with their feet in water till the dead body is burnt? For that is thought to prevent the disease transferring itself to them. Again, when a she-goat takes a bit of a ringo into her mouth, why do the whole herd stand still, till the goat herd comes up and takes it out of her mouth? There are other properties that have connection and communication, and that transfer themselves from one thing to another with incredible quickness and over immense distances. But we marvel more at intervals of time than place. And yet is it more wonderful that Athens should have been smitten with a plague that started in Arabia, and of which Pericles died and Thucydides fell sick, than that, when the Delphians and Sybarites became wicked. Vengeance should have fallen on their descendants. For properties have relations and connections between ends and 350 beginnings, and although the reason of them may not be known by us, they silently perform their errand. Moreover the public punishments of cities by the gods admits of a just defense. For a city is one continuous entity, a sort of creature that never changes from age, or becomes different by time, 
but is ever sympathetic with and conformable to itself, and is answerable for whatever it does or has done for the public weal. As long as the community by its union and federal bonds preserves its unity. For he that would make several, or rather any quantity of, cities out of one by process of time would be like a person who made one human being several, by regarding him now as an old man, now as a young man, now as a stripling. Or rather this kind of reasoning resembles the arguments of Epicharmus, from whom the sophists borrowed the piled-up method of reasoning, for example, he incurred the debt long ago, so he does not owe it now, being a different person, or he was invited to dinner yesterday, but he comes uninvited today, for he is another person. And yet age produces greater changes in any individual than it does commonly in cities. For any one would recognize Athens again if he had not seen it for thirty years, for the present habits and feelings of the people there, their business, amusements, likes and dislikes, are just what they were long ago. Whereas a man's friend or acquaintance meeting him after some time would hardly recognize his appearance, for the change of character easily introduced by every thought and deed, feeling and custom. Produce a wonderful strangeness and novelty in the same person. And yet a man is reckoned to be the same person from birth to death, and similarly we think it right for a city always remaining the same to be liable to reproach for the ill deeds of its former inhabitants. On the same principle as it enjoys its ancient glory and power. Or shall we, without being aware of it, throw everything into Heraclitus' river, into which he says a person cannot step twice, since nature is ever changing and altering everything? 351 If then a city is one continuous entity, so of course is a race that starts from one beginning, that can trace back intimate union and similarity of faculties, for that which is begot is not, like some production of art, unlike the begetter. For it proceeds from him, and is not merely produced by him, so that it appropriately receives his share, whether that be honor or punishment. And if I should not seem to be trifling, I should say that the bronze statue of Cassander melted down by the Athenians, and the body of Dionysius thrown out of their territory by the Syracusans after his death, were treated more unjustly than punishing their posterity would have been. For there was none of the nature of Cassander in the statue, and the soul of Dionysius had left his dead body before this outrage, whereas Nicias and Apollocrates, Antipater and Philip, and similarly other sons of wicked parents had innate in them a good deal of their fathers, and that no listless or inactive element, but one by which they lived and were nourished, and by which their ideas were controlled. Nor is it at all strange or absurd that some should have their fathers' characteristics. And to speak generally, as in surgery whatever is useful is also just, and that person would be ridiculous who should say it was unjust to cauterize the thumb when the hip joints were in pain, and to lance the stomach when the liver was inflamed. Or when oxen were tender in their hoofs to anoint the tips of their horns, so he that looks for any other justice and punishment than curing vice, and is dissatisfied if surgery is employed to one part to benefit another. As surgeons open a vein to relieve ophthalmia, can see nothing beyond the evidence of the senses, and does not remember that even a schoolmaster by correcting one lad admonishes others, and that by decimation a general makes his whole army obey. And so not only by one part to another comes benefit, but also to the soul through the soul, even more often than to the body through the body, come certain dispositions, and vices, or improvement of character. For just as it is likely in the case of the body that the same feelings and changes will take place, so the soul, being worked upon by fancies, naturally 352 becomes better or worse according as it has more confidence or fear. While I was thus speaking, Olympicus interposed, and said, You seem in your argument to assume the important assumption of the permanence of the soul. I replied, You too concede it, or rather did concede it. For that the deity deals with everyone according to his merit has been the assumption of our argument from the beginning. Then said he, Do you think that it follows, because the gods notice our actions and deal with us accordingly, that souls are either altogether imperishable, or for some time survive dissolution. Then said I, Not exactly so, my good sir, but is the deity so little and so attached to trifles, if we have nothing divine in ourselves, nothing resembling him, nothing lasting or sure, but that we all do fade as a leaf, as Homer says. And die after a brief life, as to take the trouble, 
like women that tend and cultivate their gardens of Adonis in pots, to create souls to flourish in a delicate body having no stability only for a day. And then to be annihilated at once by any occasion. And if you please, leaving the other gods out of the question, consider the case of our god here. Does it seem likely to you that, if he knew that the souls of the dead perish immediately, and glide out of their bodies like mist or smoke, he would enjoin many propitiatory offerings for the departed and honors for the dead. Merely cheating and beguiling those that believed in him. For my own part, I shall never abandon my belief in the permanence of the soul, unless some second Hercules shall come and take away the tripod of the Pythian priestess, and abolish and destroy the oracle. For as long as many such oracles are still given, as was said to be given to Corix of Naxus formerly, it is impious to declare that the soul dies. Then said Patroclus, What oracle do you refer to? Who was this Corix? To me both the occurrence and name are quite strange. That cannot be, said 353i, but I am to blame for using the surname instead of the name. For he that killed Archilochus in battle was called Callans, it seems, but his surname was Corix. He was first rejected by the Pythian priestess, as having slain a man sacred to the Muses, but after using many entreaties and prayers, and urging pleas in defense of his act, he was ordered to go to the dwelling of Tedix. And appease the soul of Archilochus. Now this place was Tenarum, for there they say Tedix the Cretan had gone with a fleet and founded a city, and dwelt near the place where departed souls were conjured up. Similarly also, when the Spartans were bidden by the oracle to appease the soul of Pausanias, the necromancers were summoned from Italy, and, after they had offered sacrifice, they got the ghost out of the temple. It is one and the same argument, I continued, that confirms the providence of the deity and the permanence of the soul of man, so that you cannot leave one if you take away the other. And if the soul survives after death, it makes the probability stronger that rewards or punishments will be assigned to it. For during life the soul struggles, like an athlete, and when the struggle is over, then it gets its deserts. But what rewards or punishments the soul gets when by itself in the unseen world for the deeds done in the body has nothing to do with us that are alive, and is perhaps not credited by us, and certainly unknown to us. Whereas those punishments that come on descendants and on the race are evident to all that are alive, and deter and keep back many from wickedness. For there is no more disgraceful or bitter punishment than to see our children in misfortune through our faults, and if the soul of an impious or lawless man could see after death, not his statues or honors taken from him. But his children or friends or race in great adversity owing to him, and paying the penalty for his misdeeds, no one would ever persuade him, could he come to life again, to be unjust and licentious, even for the honors of Zeus. I could tell you a story on this head, which I recently heard, but I hesitate to do so, lest you should regard it only as a myth, I confine myself therefore to probability. Pray don't, said Olympicus, let us have your story. And as the others made 350 for the same request, I said, permit me first to finish my discourse according to probability, and then, if you like, I will set my myth a-going, if it is a myth. Bayan says the deity in punishing the children of the wicked for their father's crimes is more ridiculous than a doctor administering a potion to a son or grandson for a father's or grandfather's disease. But the cases, though in some respects similar and like, are in others dissimilar. For to cure one person of a disease does not cure another, nor is one any better, when suffering from ophthalmia or fever, by seeing another anointed or poulticed. But the punishments of evil doers are exhibited to everybody for this reason, that it is the function of justice, when it is carried out as reason dictates, to check some by the punishment of others. So that Bayan did not see in what respect his comparison touched our subject. For sometimes, when a man falls into a grievous but not incurable malady, which afterwards by intemperance and negligence ruins his constitution and kills him, is not his son who is not supposed to be suffering from the same malady but only to have a predisposition for it, enjoined to a careful manner of living by his medical man, or friend, or intelligent trainer in gymnastics, or honest guardian, and recommended to abstain from fish and pastry, wine and women, and to take medicine frequently, and to go in for training in the gymnasiums, and so to dissipate and get rid of the small seeds of what might be a serious malady. 
if he allowed it to come to a head. Do we not indeed give advice of this kind to the children of diseased fathers or mothers, bidding them take care and be cautious and not to neglect themselves, but at once to arrest the first germ of the malady? Nipping it in the bud while removable, and before it has got a firm footing in the constitution? Certainly we do, said all the company. We are not then, I continued, acting in a strange or ridiculous but in a necessary and useful way, in arranging their exercise and food and physic for the sons of epileptic or atrabilious or gouty people, not when they are ill. But to prevent their becoming so. For the offspring of a poor constitution does not require punishment, but it does require medical treatment and care, and if any one stigmatizes this, because it curtails pleasure and involves some self-denial 355 and pain. As a punishment inflicted by cowardice and timidity, we care not for his opinion. Can it be right to tend and care for the body that has an hereditary predisposition to some malady, and are we to neglect the growth and spread in the young character of hereditary taint of vice, and to dally with it? And wait till it be plainly mixed up with the feelings, and, to use the language of Pinder, produce malignant fruit in the heart? Or is the deity in this respect no wiser than Hesiod? who exhorts and advises, not to beget children on our return from a sad funeral, but after a banquet with the gods, as though not vice or virtue only. But sorrow or joy and all other propensities, came from generation, to which the poet bids us come gay and agreeable and sprightly. But it is not Hesiod's function, or the work of human wisdom, but it belongs to the deity, to discern and accurately distinguish similarities and differences of character before they become obvious by resulting in crime through the influence of the passions. For the young of bears and wolves and apes manifest from their birth the nature innate in them in all its naked simplicity. Whereas mankind, under the influence of customs and opinions and laws, frequently conceal their bad qualities and imitate what is good, so as altogether to obliterate and escape from the innate taint of vice, or to be undetected for a long time. Throwing the veil of craft round their real nature, so that we are scarce conscious of their villainy till we feel the blow or smart of some unjust action. So that we are in fact only aware that there is such a thing as injustice when men act unjustly, or as vice when men act viciously, or as cowardice when men run away, just as if one were to suppose that scorpions had a sting only when they stung us. Or that vipers were venomous only when they bit us, which would be a very silly idea. For every bad man is not bad only when he breaks out into crime, but he has the seeds of vice in his nature, and is only vicious in act when he has opportunity and means, as opportunity makes the thief steal, and the tyrant violate the laws. But the deity is 356 not ignorant of the nature and disposition of every man, inasmuch as by his very nature he can read the soul better than the body, and does not wait to punish violence in the act, or shamelessness in the tongue or lasciviousness in the members. For he does not retaliate upon the wrongdoer as having been ill-treated by him, nor is he angry with the robber as having been plundered by him, nor does he hate the adulterer as having himself suffered from his licentiousness. But it is to cure him that he often punishes the adulterous or avaricious or unjust man in embryo, before he has had time to work out all his villainy, as we try to stop epileptic fits before they come on. Just now we were dissatisfied that the wicked were punished late and tardily, whereas at present we find fault with the deity for correcting the character and disposition of same before they commit crime. From our ignoring that the future deed may be worse and more dreadful than the past, and the hidden intention than the overt act. For we are not able fully to understand the reasons why it is better to leave some alone in their ill deeds, and to arrest others in the intention. Just as no doubt medicine is not appropriate in the case of some patients, which would be beneficial to others not ill, but yet perhaps in a more dangerous condition still. And so the gods do not visit all the offenses of parents on their children, but if a good man is the son of a bad one, as the son of a sickly parent is sometimes of a good constitution, he is exempt from the punishment of his race. As not being a participator in its viciousness. But if a young man imitates his vicious race it is only right that he should inherit the punishment of their ill deeds, as he would their debts. For Antigonus was not punished for Demetrius, nor, of the old heroes, Phileus for Augeus, or Nestor for Neleus, for though their sires were bad they were good, 
but those whose nature liked and approved the vices of their ancestors. These justice punished, taking vengeance on their similarity in viciousness. For as the warts and moles and freckles of parents often skip a generation, and reappear in the grandsons and granddaughters, and as a Greek woman, 357 that had a black baby and so was accused of adultery, found out that she was the great-granddaughter of an Ethiopian, and as the son of Pytho the Nisibian who recently died, and who was said to trace his descent to the Sparty, had the birthmark on his body of the print of a spear the token of his race. Which though long dormant had come up again as out of the deep, so frequently earlier generations conceal and suppress the mental idiosyncrasies and passions of their race, which afterwards nature causes to break out in other members of the family. And so displays the family bent either to vice or virtue. When I had said thus much I was silent, but Olympicus smiled and said, We do not praise you, lest we should seem to forget your promise story, as though what you had advanced was adequate proof enough. But we will give our opinion when we have heard it. Then I began as follows. Thespesius of Soli, an intimate friend of that protogenes who lived in this city with us for some time, had been very profligate during the early part of his life, and had quickly run through his property. And for some time owing to his straits had given himself up to bad practices, when repenting of his old ways, and following the pursuit of riches, he resembled those profligate husbands that pay no attention to their wives while they live with them. But get rid of them, and then, after they have married other men, do all they can wickedly to seduce them. Abstaining then from nothing dishonorable that could bring either enjoyment or gain, in no long time he got together no great amount of property, but a very great reputation for villainy. But what most damaged his character was the answer he received from the oracle of Amphilochus. For he sent it seems a messenger to consult the god whether he would live the rest of his life better, and the answer was he would do better after his death. And indeed this happened in a sense not long after. For he fell headlong down from a great height, and though he had received no wound 358 nor even a blow, the fall did for him, but three days after, just as he was about to be buried, he recovered. He soon picked up his strength again, and went home, and so changed his manner of life that people would hardly credit it. For the Cilicians say that they know nobody who was in those days more fair-dealing in business, or more devout to the deity, or more disagreeable to his enemies, or more faithful to his friends. Insomuch that all who had any dealings with him desired to hear the reason of this change, not thinking that so great a reformation of character could have proceeded from chance, and their idea was correct. As his narrative to Protogenes and others of his great friends showed. For he told them that, when his soul left the body, the change he first underwent was as if he were a pilot thrown violently into the sea out of a ship. Then raising himself up a little, he thought he recovered the power of breathing again altogether, and looked round him in every direction, as if one eye of the soul was open. But he saw none of the things he had ever seen before, but stars enormous in size and at immense distance from one another, sending forth a wonderful and intense brightness of color. So that the soul was borne along and moved about everywhere quickly and easily, like a ship is fair weather. But omitting most of the sights he saw, he said that the souls of the dead mounted into the air, which yielded to them and formed fiery bubbles, and then, when each bubble quietly broke, they assumed human forms. Light and weight but with different kinds of motion, for some leapt about with wonderful agility and darted straight upwards, while others like spindles flitted round all together in a circle, some in an upward direction, some in a downward. With mixed and confused motion, hardly stopping at all, or only after a very long time. As to most of these he was ignorant who they were, but he saw two or three that he knew, and tried to approach them and talk with them, but they would not listen to him, and did not seem to be in their right minds. But out of their senses and distraught, avoiding every sight and touch, and at first turned round and round alone, but afterwards meeting many other souls whirling round and in the same condition as themselves. They moved about promiscuously with no particular object in view, and uttered 359 inarticulate sounds, like yells, mixed with wailing in terror. Other souls in the upper part of the air seemed joyful, and frequently approached one another in a friendly way, and avoided those troubled souls, and seemed to mark their displeasure by keeping themselves to themselves. And their joy and delight by extension and expansion. 
At last he said he saw the soul of a relation, that he thought he knew but was not quite sure, as he died when he was a boy, which came up to him and said to him, Welcome, Thespesius. And he wondering, and saying that his name was not Thespesius but Eridius, the soul replied, That was your old name, but henceforth it will be Thespesius. For assuredly you are not dead, but by the will of the gods are come here with your intellect, for the rest of your soul you have left in the body like an anchor. And as a proof of what I say both now and hereafter notice that the souls of the dead have no shadow and do not move their eyelids. Thespesius, on hearing these words, pulled himself somewhat more together again, and began to use his reason, and looking more closely he noticed that an indistinct and shadow-like line was suspended over him. While the others shone all round and were transparent, but were not all alike. For some were like the full moon at its brightest, throwing out one smooth even and continuous color, others had spots or light marks here and there, while others were quite variegated and strange to the sight, with black spots like snakes. While others again had dim scratches. Then the kinsmen of Thespesius, for there is nothing to prevent our calling the souls by the name of the persons, pointed out everything, and told him that Adrestia, the daughter of necessity in Zeus, was placed in the highest position to punish all crimes, and no criminal was either so great or so small as to be able to escape her either by fraud or violence. But, as there were three kinds of punishment, each had its own officer and administering functionary. For speedy vengeance undertakes the punishment of those that are to be corrected at once in the body and through their bodies, and she mildly passes by many offenses that only need expiation. But if the cure of vice demands further pains, then the deity hands over such criminals after death to justice, and those whom Justice 360 rejects as altogether incurable, Erinys, the third and fiercest of Adrestius officers, pursues as they are fleeing and wandering about in various directions, and with pitiless severity utterly undoes them all, and thrusts them down to a place not to be seen or spoken about. And, of all these punishments, that which is administered in this life by vengeance is most like those in use among the barbarians. For as among the Persians they pluck off and scourge the garments and tiaras of those that are to be punished, while the offenders weep and beg them to cease, so most punishments by fine or bodily chastisement have no sharp touch. Nor do they reach vice itself, but are only for show and sentiment. And whoever goes from this world to that incorrigible and impure, Justice takes him aside, naked as he is in soul, and unable to veil or hide or conceal his villainy, but descried all round and in all points by everybody. And shows him first to his good parents, if such they were, to let them see what a wretch he is and how unworthy of his ancestors. But if they were wicked too, seeing them punished and himself being seen by them, he is chastised for a long time till he is purged of each of his bad propensities by sufferings and pains which as much exceed in magnitude and intensity all sufferings in the flesh, as what is real is more vivid than a dream. But the scars and marks of the stripes for each bad propensity are more visible in some than in others. Observe also, he continued, the different and various colors of the souls. That dark dirty brown color is the pigment of illiberality and covetousness, and the blood red the sign of cruelty and savageness, and where the blue is their sensuality and love of pleasure are not easily eradicated. And that violet and livid color marks malice and envy, like the dark liquid ejected by the cuttlefish. For as during life vice produces these colors by the soul being acted upon by passions and reacting upon the body, so here it is the end of purification and correction when they are toned down, and the soul becomes altogether bright and one color. But as long as these colors remain, there are relapses of the passions accompanied by palpitation and throbbing of the heart, in some faint and soon suppressed, in others more violent and lasting. And some of these souls by being again and again corrected 361 recover their proper disposition and condition, while others again by their violent ignorance and excessive love of pleasure are carried into the bodies of animals. For one by weakness of reasoning power, and slowness of contemplation, is impelled by the practical element in him to generation, while another, lacking an instrument to satisfy his licentiousness, desires to gratify his passions immediately. And to get that gratification through the medium of the body. For here there is no real fruition, but only an imperfect shadow and dream of incomplete pleasure. 
After he had said this, Thespesius' kinsman hurried him at great speed through immense space, as it seemed to him, though he travelled as easily and straight as if he were carried on the wings of the sun's rays. At last he got to an extensive and bottomless abyss, where his strength left him, as he found was the case with the other souls there, for keeping together and making swoops, like birds, they flitted all round the abyss. But did not venture to pass over it. To internal view it resembled the caverns of Bacchus, being beautiful throughout with trees and green foliage and flowers of all kinds, and it breathed a soft and gentle air, laden with scents marvelously pleasant. And producing the effect that wine does on those who are topers. For the souls were elevated by its fragrance, and gay and blithe with one another, and the whole spot was full of mirth and laughter, and such songs as emanate from gaiety and enjoyment. And Thespesius' kinsman told him that this was the way Dionysus went up to heaven by, and by which he afterwards took up Semele, and it was called the place of oblivion. But he would not let Thespesius stay there, much as he wished, but forcibly dragged him away, instructing and telling him that the intellect was melted and moistened by pleasure. And that the irrational and corporeal element being watered and made flesh stirs up the memory of the body, from which comes a yearning and strong desire for generation, so called from being an inclination to the earth. When the soul is weighed down with moisture. 362 Next Aspesius travelled as far in another direction, and seemed to see a great crater into which several rivers emptied themselves, one whiter than the foam of the sea or snow, another like the purple of the rainbow. And others of various hues whose brightness was apparent at some distance, but when he got nearer the air became thinner and the colours grew dim, and the crater lost all its gay colours but white. And he saw three genii sitting together in a triangular position, mixing the rivers together in certain proportions. Then the guide of Thespesius' soul told him, that Orpheus got as far as here, when he came in quest of the soul of his wife, and from not exactly remembering what he had seen spread a false report among mankind. That the oracle at Delphi was common to Apollo and night, though Apollo had no communion with night, but this, pursued the guide, is an oracle common to night and the moon, that utters forth its oracular knowledge in no particular part of the world. Nor has it any particular seat, but wanders about everywhere in men's dreams and visions. Hence, as you see, dreams receive and disseminate a mixture of simple truth with deceit and error. But the oracle of Apollo you do not know, nor can you see it, for the earthiness of the soul does not suffer it to soar upwards, but keeps it down in dependence on the body. And taking him nearer his guide tried to show him the light from the tripod, which, as he said, shone as far as Parnassus through the bosom of Themis, but though he desired to see it he could not for its brightness. But as he passed by he heard the shrill voice of a woman speaking in verse several things, among others, he thought, telling the time of his death. That, said the genius, was the voice of the Sibyl, who sang about the future as she was being borne about in the orb of the moon. Though desirous then to hear more, he was conveyed into another direction by the violent motion of the moon, as if he had been in the eddies of a whirlpool, so that he heard very little more, only a prophecy about him to Vesuvius and that Dicarchia would be destroyed by fire, and a short piece about the 363 emperor then reigning, that, though he was good he would lose his empire through sickness. After this Thespesius and his guide turned to see those that were undergoing punishment. And at first they saw only distressing and pitiable sights, but after that, Thespesius, little expecting it, found himself among his friends and acquaintances and kinsfolk who were being punished and undergoing dreadful sufferings and hideous and bitter tortures, and who wept and wailed to him. And at last he descried his father coming up out of a certain gulf covered with marks and scars, stretching out his hands, and not allowed to keep silence. But compelled by those that presided over his torture to confess that he had been an accursed wretch and poisoned some strangers that had gold, and during his lifetime had escaped the detection of everybody. But had been found out here, and his guilt brought home to him, for which he had already suffered much, and was being dragged on to suffer more. So great was his consternation and fear that he did not dare to intercede or beg for his father's release, but wishing to turn and flee he could no longer see his gentle and kind guide, but he was thrust forward by some persons horrible to look at. 
as if some dire necessity compelled him to go through with the business, and saw that the shades of those that had been notorious criminals and punished in their lifetime were not so severely tortured here or like the others. But had an incomplete though toilsome punishment for their irrational passions. Whereas those who under the mask and show of virtue had lived all their lives in undetected vice were forced by their torturers with labor and pain to turn their souls inside out, unnaturally wriggling and writhing about. Like the sea scalapendras who, when they have swallowed the hook, turn themselves inside out. But some of them their torturers flayed and crimped so as to show their various inward vices which were only skinned over, which were deep in their soul the 364 principal part of man. And he said he saw other souls, like snakes two or three or even more twined together, devouring one another in malignity in malevolence for what they had suffered or done in life. He said also that there were several lakes running parallel, one of boiling gold, another most cold of lead, another heart of iron, and several demons were standing by, like smiths. Who lowered down and drew up by turns with instruments the souls of those whose criminality lay in insatiable cupidity. For when they were red hot and transparent through their bath in the lake of gold, the demons thrust them into the lake of lead and dipped them in that. And when they got congealed in it and hard as hail, they dipped them into the lake of iron, and there they became wonderfully black, and broken and crushed by the hardness of the iron, and changed their appearance. And after that they were dipped again in the lake of gold, after suffering, he said, dreadful agony in all these changes of torment. But he said those souls suffered most piteously of all that, when they seemed to have escaped justice, were arrested again, and these were those whose crimes had been visited on their children or descendants. For whenever one of these latter happened to come up, he fell into a rage and cried out, and showed the marks of what he had suffered, and upbraided and pursued the soul of the parent, that wished to fly and hide himself but could not. For quickly did the ministers of torture pursue them, and hurry them back again to justice, wailing all the while on account of their foreknowledge of what their punishment would be. And to some of them he said many of their posterity clung at once, and just like bees or bats stuck to them, and squeaked and gibbered in their rage at the memory of what they had suffered owing to them. Last of all he saw the souls of those that were to come into the world a second time, forcibly molded and transformed into various kinds of animals by artificers appointed for the very purpose with instruments and blows who broke off all the limbs of some, and only wrenched off some of others, and polished others down or 365 annihilated them altogether, to fit them for other habits and modes of life. Among them he saw the soul of Nero tortured in other ways, and pierced with red-hot nails. And the artificers having taken it in hand and converted it into the semblance of a pindaric viper, which gets its way to life by gnawing through its mother's womb, a great light, he said, suddenly shone, and a voice came out of the light. Ordering them to change it into something milder, so they devised of it the animal that croaks about lakes and marshes, for he had been punished sufficiently for his crimes, and now deserved some favor at the hands of the gods. For he had freed Greece, the noblest nation of his subjects and the best beloved of the gods. So much did Thespesius behold, but as he intended to return a horrible dread came upon him. For a woman, marvelous in appearance and size, took hold of him and said to him, Come here that you may the better remember everything you have seen. And she was about to strike him with a red-hot iron pin, such as the encaustic painters use, when another woman prevented her. And he was suddenly sucked up, as through a pipe, by a strong and violent wind, and lit upon his own body, and woke up and found that he was close to his tomb. In the temple at Delphi, the scene of the discussion, as we see later on, section 12. Reading Delta Kappa Epsilon Iota with Reisk. Euripides, Orestes, 420. C.F., Ion, 1615. Thucydides, 3. 38. See the circumstances in Pausanias, 4. 17 and 22. Compare Petronius, Satyricon, 44, D.I. Pedes Lenados Habent. Compare also, Tibullus, I, 9. 4. Sarah Timen Tisitis Pina Venet Pedibus. Reading Mu Lambda Iota Sigma Tau Alpha, for Mu Lambda Iota, with Wittenbach. An allusion to the proverb Psi Epsilon Theta Epsilon Nu Lambda Omicron Upsilon Sigma Iota Mu Lambda Omicron Iota, 
Lambda Omicron Upsilon Sigma Iota Delta Lambda Epsilon Pi Tau. C. Erasmus, Eta Gia. C. F. Plato, Republic, 472a. C. Note, On Abundance of Friends. Reading Epsilon Gamma Rho. Oral World. C. Above. Quoted also in, On Restraining Anger. It seems necessary to read either Pi Omicron Roseta Epsilon Iota Nu with Mez, or Roseta Epsilon Iota Nu with Wittenbach. Compare Aristophanes, Vespi, 438. C. Pausanias, 8. 27. Pinder. Homer, Iliad, 15. 641, 642. C. Thucydides, I, 127. C. Pausanias, V, 17, 8. 24, 9. 41, X, 29. Hesiod, Works and Days, 266. Ibid, 265. Compare Pausanias, 2. 9, Ovid, A, A, I, 655, 656. Significat Martyrs Christianos, in Tunica Molesta Fumantes. Reisk. Like the Sword of Damocles. C. Horus, Odes, 3. 1, 17, 21. See also Pausanias, 3. 17. Surely new new Alpha Tauro Pi Omicron Iota must be read. Compare, on curiosity. The reading is very doubtful. I adopt Delta Omicron Nu Mu Nu Epsilon Theta Kappa Epsilon Nu Iota Nu Cairo Iota Nu, Lambda Pi Delta Omicron Rho Eta Mu Omicron Nu Epsilon Rho Sigma Kappa Omicron Upsilon Sigma Iota. Euripides, Eno. C. Herodotus, 6. 86, Juvenal, 13, 199 207. The company are in the temple at Delphi, be it remembered. Called Iadman in Herodotus, 2. 134, where this story is also told. Wittenbach suggests Dallas. To Xerxes. The allusion is to the well-known story of Odysseus and the Cyclops Polyphemus, who is supposed to have dwelt in the island of Sicily, where Agathocles was tyrant. See Pausanias, 8. 14. Two were to be sent for one thousand continuous years. So the oracle. See Pausanias 9. 30, Herodotus, v. 6. C. Pausanias, 7. 27, Athenius, 372a. A former king of Thebes. C. Pausanias, 9. 5. Called Daphans, Pausanias, x. 1. Reading Pi Sigma Tau Omicron Iota with Xylander. The famous plague. C. Thucydides, 2. 47 to 54. The allusion is to the circumstances mentioned in. Videtur idem cum serita esse. Reisk. Compare our author, the E.I. Apud Delphos, see also Seneca, Epist, 58. And Plato, Cratylus, 402a. Sons of Dionysius. Sons of Cassander. Iliad, 6. 146 to 149. Compare Plato, Phaedrus, 276 b. These gardens of Adonis were what we might call flower pot gardens. See Erasmus, Eta Gia. Epsilon Theta seems the best reading, Epsilon is flat. Apollo. C. Hesiod, Works and Days, 735, 736. Compare the French proverb, L'occasion fait le laron. And Juvenal's Nemo repent fut terpissimus. So Reisk very ingeniously. A rather far fetched pedigree. See Pausanias, 8. 11, 9. 5, 10. See also Ovid, Metamorphoses, Book 3. 100 to 130. Compare, on love. At Malus, in Cilicia. C. Pausanias, I, 34. Reading Phi Iota Lambda Eta Delta Omicron Nu Alpha Sigma with Reisk. 
Reading delta iota alpha pi epsilon pi omicron iota kappa iota lambda mu nu omicron nu nu with Wittenbach. A paranomasia on gamma nu epsilon sigma iota as if pi gamma nu nu epsilon sigma iota. We cannot English it. Eurydice. Mu iota gamma nu mu epsilon nu omicron nu, turn, ed bong, risk. Surely the right reading. Latin cutiali. Vespasian. C. Suetonius, Vespasian, ch. 24, as to the particulars of his death. The reading is very doubtful. I have followed Wittenbach in reading tau rho iota beta omicron mu nu aden nu tau rho iota beta nu tau epsilon lambda. Such as that of the Danaides. So Wittenbach. Adopting the arrangement of Wittenbach. Compare Homer, Odyssey, 24. 5 to 10. C. Pausanias, 7. 17, for a sneaking kindness for Nero. C. Athenius, 687b. Reading Delta Iota with Risk. Against borrowing money. Plato in his laws does not permit neighbors to use one another's water, unless they have first dug for themselves as far as the clay, and reached ground that is unsuitable for a well. For clay, having a rich and compact nature, absorbs the water it receives, and does not let it pass through. But he allows people that cannot make a well of their own to use their neighbor's water, for the law ought to relieve necessity. Ought there not also to 366 be a law about money, that people should not borrow of others, nor go to other people's sources of income, until they have first examined their own resources at home, and collected, as by drops. What is necessary for their use? But nowadays from luxury and effeminacy and lavish expenditure people do not use their own resources, though they have them, but borrow from others at great interest without necessity. And what proves this very clearly is the fact that people do not lend money to the needy, but only to those who, wanting an immediate supply, bring a witness and adequate security for their credit. So that they can be in no actual necessity of borrowing. Why pay court to the banker or trader? Borrow from your own table. You have cups, silver dishes, pots and pans. Use them in your need. Beautiful olives or tenidos will furnish you with earthenware instead, purer than silver, for they will not smell strongly and unpleasantly of interest, a kind of rust that daily soils your sumptuousness. Nor will they remind you of the calends and the new moon, which, though the most holy of days, the money lenders make ill omened and hateful. For those who instead of selling them put their goods out at pawn cannot be saved even by Zeus the protector of property, they are ashamed to sell, they are not ashamed to pay interest on their goods when out at pawn. And yet the famous Pericles made the ornament of Athene, which weighed forty talents of fine gold, removable at will, for, so, he said, we can use the gold in war, and at some other time restore as costly a one. So should we too in our necessities, as in a siege, not receive a garrison imposed on us by a hostile money lender, nor allow our goods to go into slavery. But stripping our table, our bed, our carriages, and our diet, of superfluities, we should keep ourselves free, intending to restore all those things again, if we have good luck. So the Roman matrons offered their gold and ornaments as first fruits to Pythian Apollo, out of which a golden cup was made and sent to Delphi. And the Carthaginian matrons had their heads shorn, and with the 367 hair cut off made cords for the machines and engines to be used in defense of their country. But we being ashamed of independence enslave ourselves to covenants and conditions, when we ought to restrict and confine ourselves to what is useful, and dock or sell useless superfluities, to build a temple of liberty for ourselves, our wives, and children. The famous Artemis at Ephesus gives asylum and security from their creditors to debtors, when they take refuge in her temple. But the asylum and sanctuary of frugality is everywhere open to the sober-minded, affording them joyful and honorable and ample space for much ease. For as the Pythian priestess told the Athenians at the time of the Median War that the god had given them wooden walls, and they left the region and city, their goods and houses, and took refuge in their ships for liberty. So the God gives us a wooden table, an earthenware plate, and coarse garments, if we wish to live free. Care not for fine horses or chariots with handsome harness, adorned with gold and silver, 
which swift interest will catch up and outrun, but mounted on any chance donkey or nag flee from the hostile and tyrannical moneylender. Not demanding like the mead land and water, but interfering with your liberty, and lowering your status. If you pay him not, he duns you, if you offer the money, he won't have it, if you are selling anything, he cheapens the price, if you don't want to sell, he forces you, if you sue him, he comes to terms with you, if you swear, he hectors. If you go to his house, he shuts the door in your face, whereas if you stay at home, he billets himself on you, and is ever rapping at your door. How did Solon benefit the Athenians by ordaining that debtors should no longer have to pay in person? For they are slaves to all money lenders, and not to them only, what would there be so monstrous in that? But to their 368 slaves, who are insolent and savage barbarians, such as Plato represents the fiery torturers and executioners in Hades who preside over the punishment of the impious. For they make the forum a hell for wretched debtors, and like vultures devour and rend them limb from limb, piercing into their bowels, and stand over others and prevent their tasting their own grapes or crops, as if they were so many tantaluses. And as Darius sent Datus and Artaphernes to Athens with manacles and chains in their hands for their captives, so they bring into Greece boxes full of bonds and agreements, like fetters, and visit the towns and scour the country round. Sowing not like Triptolemus harmless corn, but planting the toilsome and prolific and never-ending roots of debts, which grow and spread all round, and ruin and choke cities. They say that hares at once give birth and suckle and conceive again, but the debts of these knaves and barbarians give birth before they conceive. For at the very moment of giving they ask back, and take up what they laid down, and lend what they take for lending. It is a saying among the Messenians, that, there is a Pilus before Pilus, and another Pilus too. So it may be said with respect to these money lenders, there is interest before interest, and other interest too. Then of course they laugh at those natural philosophers who say that nothing can come of nothing, for they get interest on what neither is nor was. And they think it disgraceful to farm out the taxes, though the law allows it, while they themselves against the law exact tribute for what they lend, or rather, if one is to say the truth, defraud as they lend. For he who receives less than he signs his name for is defrauded. The Persians indeed think lying a secondary crime, but debt a principal one for lying frequently follows upon debt, but money lenders tell more lies, for they make fraudulent entries in their account books. Writing down that they have given so and so so much, when they have really given less. And the only excuse for their lying is covetousness, not necessity, not utter poverty, but insatiable greediness, the outcome of which is without enjoyment and useless to 369 themselves, and fatal to their victims. For neither do they farm the fields which they rob their debtors of, nor do they inhabit their houses when they have thrust them out, nor use their tables or apparel, but first one is ruined, and then a second is hunted down. For whom the first one serves as a decoy. For the bane spreads and grows like a fire, to the destruction and ruin of all who fall into their clutches, for it consumes one after another. And the money lender, who fans and feeds this flame to ensnare many, gets no more advantage from it but that some time after he can take his account book and read how many he has sold up, how many turned out of house and home. And track the sources of his wealth, which is ever growing into a larger pile. And do not think I say this as an enemy proclaiming war against the money lenders. For never did they lift my cows or horses. But merely to prove to those who too readily borrow money what disgrace and servitude it brings with it and what extreme folly and weakness it is. Have you anything? Do not borrow, for you are not in a necessitous condition. Have you nothing? Do not borrow, for you will never be able to pay back. Let us consider either case separately. Cato said to a certain old man who was a wicked fellow, My good sir, why do you add the shame that comes from wickedness to old age, that has so many troubles of its own? So too do you, since poverty has so many troubles of its own, not add the terrible distress that comes from borrowing money and from debt, and do not take away from poverty its only advantage over wealth, its freedom from corroding care. For the proverb that says, I cannot carry a goat, put an ox on my shoulder, has a ridiculous ring. Unable to bear poverty, are you going to put on your back a money lender, 
a weight hard to carry even for a rich man. How then, will you say, am I to maintain myself? Do you ask this, having two hands, two legs, and a tongue, in short, being a man, to love and be loved, to give and receive benefits? Can you not be a schoolmaster 370 or tutor, or porter, or sailor, or make coasting voyages? Any of these ways of getting a livelihood is less disgraceful and difficult than to always have to hear, pay me that thou owest. The well-known Rutilius went up to Musonius at Rome, and said to him, Musonius, Zeus Soter, whom you imitate and emulate, does not borrow money. And Musonius smilingly answered, Neither does he lend. For you must know Rutilius, himself a lender, was bantering Musonius for being a borrower. What stoic inflatedness was all this? What need was there to bring in Zeus Soter? For all nature teaches the same lesson. Swallows do not borrow money, nor do ants, although nature has given them no hands, or reason, or profession. But men have intellect in excess, and so ingenious are they that they keep near them horses, and dogs, and partridges, and jackdaws. Why then do you despair, who are as impressible as a jackdaw? have as much voice as a partridge, and are as noble as a dog, of getting some person to befriend you, by looking after him, winning his affections, guarding him, fighting his battles. Do you not see how many opportunities there are both on land and sea? As Crate says. Mixilus and his wife, too. Ward off famine in these bad times, I saw. Both carding wool. And King Antigonus asked Cleanthes, when he saw him at Athens after a long interval, Do you still grind, Cleanthes? And he replied, I do, O king, but for my living, yet so as not to desert philosophy. Such was the admirable spirit of the man who, coming from the mill and kneading trough, wrote with the hand that had baked and ground about the gods, and the moon, and stars, and the sun. But those kinds of labor are in our view servile. And so that we may appear free, we borrow money and flatter and dance attendance on slaves, and give them dinners and presents, and pay taxes as it were to them, not on account of our poverty, for no one lends money to a poor man. But from our love of lavish expenditure. For if we were content with things necessary for subsistence, the race of money lenders would be as extinct as centaurs and 371 gorgons are. It is luxury that has created them as much as goldsmiths, and silversmiths, and perfumers, and dyers in bright colors. For we do not owe money for bread and wine, but for estates, and slaves, and mules, and dining rooms, and tables, and for our lavish public entertainments, in our unprofitable and thankless ambition. And he that is once involved in debt remains in it all his time, like a horse bit and bridled that takes one rider after another, and there is no escape to green pastures and meadows. But they wander about like those demons who were driven out of heaven by the gods who are thus described by Empedocles. Into the sea the force of. Heaven thrusts them, the sea rejects them. Back upon the land. To the sun's rays th. Unresting earth remits them, the sun anon. Whirls them to heaven again. So one after another usurer or traitor gets hold of the poor wretch, hailing either from Corinth, or Patry, or Athens, till he gets set on to buy them all, and torn to bits, and cut into mincemeat as it were for his interest. For as a person who is fallen into the mire must either get up out of it or remain in it, and if he turns about in it, and wallows in it, and bedabbles his body all over in it, he contracts only the greater defilement. So by borrowing from one person to pay another and changing their money lenders they contract and incur fresh interest, and get into greater liabilities, and closely resemble sufferers from cholera. Whose case does not admit of cure because they evacuate everything they are ordered to take, and so ever add to the disease. So these will not get cleansed from the disease of debt, but at regular times in the year pay their interest with pain and agony, and then immediately another creditor presents his little account, so again their heads swim and ache. When they ought to have got rid of their debts altogether, and regained their freedom. I now turn my attention to those who are rich and luxurious, and use language like the following, Am I then to go without slaves and hearth and home? As if any dropsical person, whose body was greatly swollen and who was very weak, should say to his doctor, 
am I then to become lean and empty? And why not, to get well, 372 and do you too go without a slave, not to be a slave yourself? And without chattels, not to be another man's chattel? Listen to a story about two vultures, one was vomiting and saying it would bring its inside up, and the other who was by said, what harm if you do? For it won't be your inside you bring up, but that dead body we devoured lately. And so any debtor does not sell his own estate, or his own house, but his creditors, for he has made him by law master of them. Nay, but by Zeus, says one, my father left me this field. Yes, and your father also left you liberty and a status in the community, which you ought to value more than you do. And your father begot you with hand and foot, but should either of them mortify, you pay the surgeon to cut it off. Thus Calypso clad and dressed Odysseus, in raiment smelling sweet, like the body of an immortal, as a gift and token of her affection for him. But when his vessel was upset and he himself immersed, and owing to this wet and heavy raiment could hardly keep himself on the top of the waves, he threw it off and stripped himself, and covered his naked breast with Eno's veil. And, swam for it gazing on the distant shore, and so saved his life, and lacked neither food nor raiment. What then? Have not poor debtors storms, when the moneylender stands over them and says, Pay. Thus spoke Poseidon, and the clouds did gather, and lashed the sea to fury, and at once Eurus and Notus and the stormy Zephyr blew all together. Thus interest rolls on interest as wave upon wave, and he that is involved in debt struggles against the load that bears him down, but cannot swim away and escape, but sinks to the bottom and carries with him to ruin his friends that have gone security for him. But Crates the Theban, though he had neither duns nor debts, and was only disgusted at the distracting cares of housekeeping, gave up a property worth eight talents, and assumed the philosopher's threadbare cloak and wallet, and took refuge 373 inches philosophy and poverty. And Anaxagoras left his sheep farm. But why need I mention these? Since the lyric poet Philoxenus, obtaining by lot in a Sicilian colony much substance and a house abounding in every kind of comfort, but finding that luxury and pleasure and absence of refinement was the fashion there, said. By the gods these comforts shall not undo me, I will give them up, and he left his lot to others, and sailed home again. But debtors have to put up with being dunned, subjected to tribute, suffering slavery, passing debased coin, and like Phineas, feeding certain winged harpies, who carry off and lay violent hands on their food, not at the proper season. For they get possession of their debtor's corn before it is sown, and they traffic for oil before the olives are ripe. And the moneylender says, I have wine at such and such a price, and takes a bond for it, when the grapes are yet on the vine waiting for our tourists to ripen them. Page 844, A, B, C. Reading with Wittenbach Delta Iota Delta Omicron Sigma Iota and Chi Omicron Upsilon Sigma Iota. C. Livy, V. 25. C. Appian, L. V. 26. C. Herodotus, 7. 141 to 143, 8. 51. Reading with Rice Kappa Alpha Tau Chiro Upsilon Sigma Alpha. The technical term for submission to an enemy. See Pausanias, 3. 12, x, 20. Herodotus, v, 17, 18, 7. 133. Reading with Rice Delta Alpha Nu Epsilon Iota Sigma Tau Alpha. Perhaps Phi Alpha Nu Iota Sigma Tau Alpha originally came after Gamma Rho Omicron Iota, and got somehow displaced. See Homer, Odyssey, 11. 578. 579, and context. Homer, Iliad, I, 154. Odyssey, v, 264. Odyssey, v, 333 to 375. Odyssey, v, 439. Odyssey, v, 291 to 295. Whether, live unknown, be a wise precept. He who uttered this precept certainly did not wish to live unknown, for he uttered it to let all the world know he was a superior thinker, and to get to himself unjust glory by exhorting others to shun glory. I hate the wise man for 
himself not wise. They say that Philoxenus the son of Eryxus and Natho the Sicilian, being exceedingly greedy where good fare was going, would blow their nose in the dishes, to disgust all others at the table. That they alone might take their fill of the choicest dishes. So those that are insatiable pursuers of glory calumniate glory to others who are their rivals, that they may get it without antagonists. In this they 374 resemble rowers, who face the stern of the vessel but propel it ahead, that by the recoil from the stroke of their oars they may reach port. So those that give vent to precepts like this pursue glory with their face turned in the opposite direction. For otherwise what need was there to utter a precept like this, or to write and hand it down to posterity, if he wished to live unknown to his own generation, who did not wish to live unknown to posterity. Look at the matter in the following way. Has not that live unknown a villainous ring, as though one had broken open graves? Is your life so disgraceful that we must all be ignorant of it? For my part one should say, even if your life be bad do not live unknown, but be known, reform, repent, if you have virtue, be not utterly useless in life, if you are vicious, do not continue unreformed. Point out then and define to whom you recommend this precept. If to an ignorant or wicked or senseless person, you resemble one who should say to a person in a fever or delirium, be unknown. Don't let the doctor know your condition. Go and throw yourself into some dark place, that you and your ailments may be unknown. So you say to a vicious man, go off with your vice, and hide your deadly and irremediable disease from your friends, fearful to show your superstitious fears, palpitations as it were, to those who could admonish you and cure you. Our remote ancestors paid public attention to the sick, and if any one had either had or cured a similar complaint, he communicated his experience to the patient, and so they say medical art became great by these contributions from experience. We ought also in the same way to expose to everyone diseased lives and the passions of the soul, and to handle them, and to examine the condition of each, and say, Are you a passionate man? Be on your guard against anger. Are you of a jealous turn? Look to it. Are you in love? I myself was in love once, but I had to repent. But nowadays people deny and conceal and cloak their vices, and so fix them deeper in themselves. Moreover if you advise men of worth to live on 375 known and in obscurity, you say to Epaminandus, do not be a general, and to Lycurgus, do not be a legislator, and to Thrasybulus, do not be a tyrannicide, and to Pythagoras, do not teach. And to Socrates, do not discourse. And first and foremost you bid yourself, Epicurus, to refrain from writing letters to your friends in Asia, and from enrolling Egyptian strangers among your disciples, and from dancing attendance on the youths of Lampsicus. And sending books to all quarters to display your wisdom to all men and all women, and leaving directions in your will about your funeral. What is the meaning of those common tables of yours? What that crowd of friends and handsome youths? Why those many thousand lines written and composed so laboriously on Metrodorus, and Aristobulus, and Charidemus, that they may not be unknown even in death, if you ordain for virtue oblivion, for art inactivity, for philosophy silence. And for success that it should be speedily forgotten. But if you exclude all knowledge about life, like putting the lights out at a supper party, that you may go from pleasure to pleasure undetected, then, live unknown. Certainly if I am going to pass my life with the harlot Hidea, or my days with Leontium, and spurn at virtue, and put my summum bonum in sensual gratifications, these are ends that require darkness and night. On these oblivion and ignorance are rightly cast. But if any one in nature sings the praises of the deity and justice and providence, and in morals upholds the law and society and the constitution, and in the constitution what is honorable and not expedient, why should he live unknown? Is it that he should instruct nobody, inspire in nobody an emulation for virtue, and be to nobody a pattern in good? Had Themistocles been unknown at Athens, Greece would not have repelled Xerxes. Had Camillus been unknown at Rome, Rome would not have remained a state, had Plato been unknown to Dion, Sicily would not have won its freedom. And as light, I take it, makes us not only visible 376 but useful to one another, so knowledge gives not only glory but impetus to virtue. 
Epaminandus in obscurity up to his fortieth year was no use to the Thebans, but when his merits became known and he was put into power, he saved his state from ruin and liberated Greece from slavery. Making his abilities efficacious in emergency through his reputation like the bright shining of a light. For Sophocles' words. Brightly shines brass in use. But when in used it groweth dull in time. And mars the house. Are also appropriate to the character of a man, which gets rusty and senile by not mixing in affairs but living in obscurity. For mute and glorious ease, and a sedentary life devoted to leisure, not only injure the body but also the soul, and as hidden waters overshadowed and stagnant get foul because they have no outlet, so the innate powers of unruffled lives. That neither imbibe nor pass on anything, even if they had any useful element in them once, seem to be a feat and wasted. Have you never noticed how when night comes on a tired languor seizes the body, an inactive torpor overpowers the soul, and reason shrinks within itself like a fire going out, and feeling quite worn out is gently agitated by disordered fancies. Only just indicating that the man is alive. But when the sun rises and scares away deceitful dreams, and brings on as it were the everyday world and with its light rouses and stimulates the thoughts and actions of everybody, then, as Democritus says, men form new ideas for the day. And betake themselves to their various pursuits with mutual impetuosity, as if drawn by a strong impulse. And I think that life itself, and the way we come into the world, is so ordained by the deity that we should know one another. For everyone comes into this great universe obscure and unknown casually and by degrees, but when he mixes with his fellows and grows to maturity he shines forth, and becomes well known instead of obscure, 377 and conspicuous instead of unknown. For knowledge is not the road to being, as some say, but being to knowledge, for being does not create but only exhibits things, as death is not the reducing of existence to non-existence, but rather the result of dissolution is obscurity. So people considering the sun as Apollo according to hereditary and ancient institutions, call him Delius and Pythias. Whereas the lord of the world of darkness, whether god or demon, they call Hades, for when we die we go into an unseen and invisible place, and the lord of dark night and idle sleep. And I think our ancestors called man himself by a word meaning light, because by their relationship to light all have implanted in them a strong and vehement desire to know and to be known. And some philosophers think that the soul itself is light in its essence, inferring so on other grounds and because it can least endure ignorance about facts, and hates everything obscure, and is disturbed at everything dark. Which inspires fear and suspicion in it, whereas light is so dear and welcome to it that it thinks nothing otherwise delightful bearable without it, as indeed light makes every pleasure pastime and enjoyment gay and cheerful. Like the application of some sweet and general flavor. But the man who thrusts himself into obscurity, and wraps himself up in darkness and buries himself alive, is like one who is dissatisfied with his birth, and renounces his being. And yet Pindar tells us that the abode of the blessed is a glorious existence, where the sun shines bright through the entire night in meadows red with roses, an extensive plain full of shady trees ever in bloom and ever in fruit. Watered by gentle purling streams, and there the blessed ones pass their time away in thinking and talking about the past and present in social converse. But the third road is of those who have lived unholy and lawless lives, that thrusts their souls to Erebus and the bottomless pit, where sluggish streams of murky night belch forth endless darkness. Which receive those that are to be punished 378 and conceal them in forgetfulness and oblivion. For vultures do not always prey on the liver of wicked persons lying on the ground, for it is destroyed by fire or has rolled away. Nor does the carrying of heavy burdens press upon and tire out the bodies of those that undergo punishment. For their strength has no longer flesh and bones. Nor have the dead any vestige of body that can receive the infliction of punishment that can make impression. But in reality the only punishment of those who have lived ill is infamy and obscurity and utter annihilation, which hurries them off to the dark river of oblivion, and plunges them into the abyss of a fathomless sea. Involving them in uselessness and idleness, ignorance and obscurity. Probably Epicurus, as we infer from the very personal. Euripides, Fragm. 
930. Reading with Wittenbach, Lambda Lambda Tau Omicron Tau Omicron Mu Nu Tau Alpha Tau. Reading Kappa Sigma Tau Omicron Upsilon for Kappa Alpha Sigma Tau Omicron Nu. Reisk proposed Kappa Sigma Tau Omega Nu. Reading Epsilon, for Nu Alpha, with Zeilander and Wittenbach. Reading with Wittenbach. Adopting the suggestion of Wittenbach, Forte Kappa Alpha Lambda Omicron, at Amiot. Frag. 742. Dormians Quisk in Peculiarum Abust Mumdum, Expurge Factus in Communum Redit. Zylander. Compare Herrick's poem, Dreams. Bright. Invisible. Phi. Reading with Wittenbach Chi Theta Alpha Rho Epsilon Iota. Reading Phi Eta Sigma Nu for Phi Sigma Iota Nu. Hiatus Hic Bald Deflendus. As was fabled about Titius, Odyssey, 11. 576 to 579. Odyssey, 11. 219. So Reisk, Pi Omicron Tau Alpha Mu Nu Tau Lambda Theta Eta. On Exile. They say those discourses, like friends, are best and surest that come to our refuge and aid in adversity, and are useful. For many who come forward do more harm than good in the remarks they make to the unfortunate, as people unable to swim trying to rescue the drowning get entangled with them and sink to the bottom together. Now the discourse that ought to come from friends and people disposed to be helpful should be consolation, and not mere assent with a man's sad feelings. For we do not in adverse circumstances need people to weep and wail with us like choruses in a tragedy, but people to speak plainly to us and instruct us, that grief and dejection of mind are in all cases useless and idle and senseless. And that where the circumstances themselves, when examined by the light of reason, enable a man to say to himself that his trouble is greater in fancy than in reality, it is quite ridiculous not to inquire of the body what it has suffered. Nor of the mind if it is any the worse for what has happened, 379 but to employ external sympathizers to teach us what our grief is. Therefore let us examine alone by ourselves the weight of our misfortunes, as if they were burdens. For the body is weighed down by the burden of what presses on it, but the soul often adds to the real load a burden of its own. A stone is naturally hard, and ice naturally cold, but they do not receive these properties and impressions from without. Whereas with regard to exile and loss of reputation or honors, as also with regard to their opposites, as crowns and office and position, it is not their own intrinsic nature but our opinion of them that is the gauge of their real joy or sorrow. So that each person makes them for himself light or heavy, easy to bear or hard to bear. When Polynices was asked. What is to be an exile? Is. It grievous? He replied to the question. Most grievous, and indeed. Worse than in word. Compare with this the language of Alcman, as the poet has represented him in the following lines. Sardis, my father's ancient home, had I had the fortune to be reared in thee, I should have been dressed in gold as a priest of Sibylle, and beaten the fine drums. But as it is my name is Alcman, and I am a citizen of Sparta, and I have learned to write Greek poetry which makes me greater than the tyrants Dasiles or Gyges. Thus the very same thing one man's opinion makes good, like current coin, and another's bad and injurious. But let it be granted that exile is, as many say and sing, a grievous thing. So some food is bitter, and sharp, and biting to the taste, yet by an admixture with it of sweet and agreeable food we take away its unpleasantness. There are also some colors unpleasant to look at, that quite confuse and dazzle us by their intensity and excessive force. If then we can relieve this by a mixture of shadow, or by diverting the eye to green or some agreeable color, so too can we deal with misfortunes, mixing up 380 with them the advantages and pleasant things we still enjoy, as wealth, or friends. Or leisure, and no deficiency in what is necessary for our subsistence. For I do not think that there are many natives of Sardis who would not choose your fortune even with exile, and be content to live as you do in a strange land, rather than, like snails who have no other home than their shells. Enjoy no other blessing but staying at home in ease. 
as then he in the comedy that was exhorting an unfortunate friend to take courage and bear up against fortune, when he asked him, how, answered, as a philosopher, so may we also play the philosopher's part and bear up against fortune manfully. How do we do when it rains, or when the north wind doth blow? We go to the fire, or the baths, or the house, or put on another coat, we don't sit down in the rain and cry. So too can you more than most revive and cheer yourself for the chill of adversity, not standing in need of outward aid, but sensibly using your actual advantages. The surgeon's cupping glasses extract the worst humors from the body to relieve and preserve the rest of it, whereas the melancholy and querulous by ever dwelling on their worst circumstances, and thinking only of them. And being engrossed by their troubles, make even useful things useless to them, at the very time when the need is most urgent. For as to those two jars, my friend, that Homer says are stored in heaven, one full of good fortunes, one of bad, it is not Zeus that presides as the dispenser of them, giving to some a gentle and even portion. And to others unmixed streams of evils, but ourselves. For the sensible make their life pleasanter and more endurable by mitigating their sorrows with the consideration of their blessings, while most people, like sieves, let the worst things stick to them while the best pass through. And so, if we fall into any real trouble or evil, we ought to get cheerfulness and ease of mind from the consideration of the actual blessings that are still left to us, mitigating outward trouble by private happiness. And as to those things which are not really evil in their nature, 381 but only so from imagination and empty fancy, we must act as we do with children who are afraid of masks, by bringing them near, and putting them in their hands. And turning them about, we accustom them never to heed them at all, and so we by bringing reason to bear on it may discover the rottenness and emptiness and exaggeration of our fancy. As a case in point let us take your present exile from what you deem your country. For in nature no country, or house, or field, or smithy, as Aristo said, or surgery, is peculiarly ours, but all such things exist or rather take their name in connection with the person who dwells in them or possesses them. For man, as Plato says, is not an earthly and immovable but heavenly plant, the head making the body erect as from a root, and turned up to heaven. And so Hercules said well. Argive or Theban am I, I. Vaunt not to be of one town only, every. Tower that does to Greece belong, that is. My country. But better still said Socrates, that he was not an Athenian or Greek, but a citizen of the world as a man might say he was a Rhodian or Corinthian, for he did not confine himself to Sunium, or Tinarum, or the Saronian mountains. See you the boundless reach of sky above, and how it holds the earth in its soft arms. These are the boundaries of our country, nor is there either exile or stranger or foreigner in these, where there is the same fire, water and air, the same rulers controllers and presidents, the sun the moon and the morning star. The same laws to all, under one appointment and ordinance the summer and winter solstices, the equinoxes, pleas and arcturus, the seasons of sowing and planting. Where there is one king and ruler, God, who has under his jurisdiction the beginning, middle and end of everything, and travels round and does everything in a regular way in accordance with nature. And in his wake to punish all transgressions of the divine law follows justice, whom 382 all men naturally invoke in dealing with one another as fellow citizens. As to your not dwelling at Sardis, that is nothing. Neither do all the Athenians dwell at Calidus, nor all the Corinthians at Cranium, nor all the Lacedaemonians at Petain. Do you consider all those Athenian strangers and exiles who removed from Melita to Diomia, where they call the month Metagetian, and keep the festival Metagetnia to commemorate their migration? and gladly and gaily accept and are content with their neighborhood with other people. Surely you would not. What part of the inhabited world or of the whole earth is very far distant from another part, seeing that mathematicians teach us that the whole earth is a mere point compared to heaven. But we, like ants or bees, if we get banished from one ant hill or hive are in sore distress and feel lost, not knowing or having learnt to make and consider all things our own, as indeed they are. And yet we laugh at the stupidity of one who asserts that the moon shines brighter at Athens than at Corinth, though in a sort we are in the same case ourselves, when in a strange land we look on the earth, 
the sea, the air, the sky. As if we doubted whether or not they were different from those we had been accustomed to. For nature makes us free and unrestrained, but we bind and confine immure and force ourselves into small and scanty space. Then too we laugh at the Persian kings, who, if the story be true, drink only of the water of the chosps, thus making the rest of the world waterless as far as they are concerned, but when we migrate to other places. We desire the water of the Cephasus, or we yearn for the Eurotus, or Taegetus, or Parnassus, and so make the whole world for ourselves houseless and homeless. Some Egyptians, who migrated to Ethiopia because of the anger and wrath of their king, to those who begged them to return to their wives and children very immodestly exposed their persons, saying that they would never be in want of wives or children while so provided. It is far more becoming and less low to say that whoever 383 has the good fortune to be provided with the few necessaries of life is nowhere a stranger, nowhere without home and hearth, only he must have besides these prudence and sense as an anchor and helm, that he may be able to moor himself in any harbour. For a person indeed who has lost his wealth it is not easy quickly to get another fortune, but every city is at once his country to the man who knows how to make it such, and has the roots by which he can live and thrive and get acclimatized in every place, as was the case with Themistocles and Demetrius of Phalerum. The latter after his banishment became a great friend of Ptolemy at Alexandria, and not only passed his days in abundance, but also sent gifts to the Athenians. And Themistocles, who was publicly entertained at the king's expense, is stated to have said to his wife and children, we should have been ruined, if we had not been ruined. And so Diogenes the cynic to the person who said to him, the people of Sinope have condemned you to banishment from Pontus, replied, and I have condemned them to stay in Pontus, by the high cliffs of the inhospitable sea. And Stratonicus asked his host at Seraphis, for what offence exile was the appointed punishment, and being told that they punished rogues by exile, said, Why then are not you a rogue, to escape from this hole of a place? For the comic poet says they get their crop of figs down there with slings, and that the island is very barely supplied with the necessaries of life. For if you look at the real facts and shun idle fancy, he that has one city is a stranger and foreigner in all others. For it does not seem to such a one fair and just to leave his own city and dwell in another. It has been your lot to be a citizen of Sparta, see that you adorn your native city, whether it be inglorious, or unhealthy, or disturbed with factions, or has its affairs in disorder. But the person whom fortune has deprived of his own city, she allows to make his home in any he fancies. That was an excellent precept of Pythagoras, choose the best kind of life, custom will make it easy. So too it is wise and profitable to say here, choose the best and pleasantest 384 city, time will make it your country, and a country that will not always distract you and trouble you and give you various orders such as, contribute so much money. Go on an embassy to Rome, entertain the prefect, perform public duties. If a person in his senses and not altogether silly were to think of these things, he would prefer to live in exile in some island, like Gryarus or Cinerus. Savage, and fruitless, ill. Repaying tillage. And that not in dejection and wailing. Or using the language of those women in Simonides. I am shut in by the dark. Roaring sea that foams all. Round. But he will rather be of the mind of Philip, who when he was thrown in wrestling, and turned round. And notice the mark his body made in the dust, said, O Hercules, what a little part of the earth I have by nature, though I desire all the world. I think also you have seen Naxus, or at any rate Hyria, which is close here. But the former was the home of Aphialtes and Otis, and the latter was the dwelling place of Orion. And Alcmean, when fleeing from the Furies, so the poets tell us, dwelt in a place recently formed by the silting of the Achilles. But I think he chose that little spot to dwell in ease and quiet, merely to avoid political disturbances and factions, and those furies informers. And the Emperor Tiberius lived the last seven years of his life in the island of Capri, and the sacred governing power of the world enclosed in his breast during all that time never changed its abode. But the incessant and constant cares of empire, coming from all sides, made not that island repose of his pure and complete. 
But he who can disembark on a small island, and get rid of great troubles, is a miserable man, if he cannot often say and sing to himself those lines of Pindar, to love the slender cypress, and to leave the Cretan pastures lying near Ida. I have but little land, where I grow strong, and have nothing to do with sorrow or faction, or the ordinances of princes, 385 or public duties in political emergencies, or state functions hard to get off. For if that seems a good saying of Callimachus, do not measure wisdom by a Persian rope, much less should we measure happiness by ropes and parasangs, and if we inhabit an island containing two hundred furlongs only. And not, like Sicily, for days sail round, ought we to wail and lament as if we were very unfortunate. For how does plenty of room bring about an easy life? Have you not heard Tantalus saying in the play? I sow a field that takes. Twelve days to travel round, the Beresintian region. But shortly after he says, My fortunes, that were once as high as heaven, now to the ground are fallen. And do say to me, Learn not to make too much of earthly things. And thus Ithoas leaving the spacious Hyperia because of the proximity of the Cyclopes, and migrating to an island far from all enterprising men, and living an unsocial life. Apart from men beside the stormy sea, yet contrived to make the life of his citizens very pleasant. And the Cyclades were first inhabited by the sons of Minos, and afterwards by the sons of Codrus and Neleus, though foolish people now think they are punished if they are exiled to them. And yet what island used as a place of exile is not of larger extent than Scyllus, where Xenophon after his military service saw a comfortable old age. And the academy, a small place bought for only three thousand drachmae, was the domicile of Plato and Xenocrates and Polemo, who taught and lived there all their lives, except one day every year. When Xenocrates went to Athens to grace the festival of Dionysus, so they said, and to see the new plays exhibited. And Theocritus of Chios twit 386 Aristotle with loving to live at the courts of Philip and Alexander, and preferring to dwell at the mouth of the Borborus to dwelling in the academy. For there is a river near Pella that the Macedonians call Borborus. As to islands Homer seems to sing their praise, and recommend them to us as if on purpose, as. She came to Lemnos, town of. Sacred Thoas. And. What Lesbos has, the seat of. The Immortals. And. He captured lofty Cyrus. Citadel of Enus. And. And those who from Dilichium. Came, and from the sacred islands called. Th. Iconides, that lie across the sea. Opposite Elis. And of the illustrious men that dwelt in islands he mentions Aeolus the favorite of the gods, and Odysseus most wise, and Ajax most brave, and Alcinous most kind to strangers. When Zeno learned that the only ship he had left was with all its freight lost at sea, he said, Fortune, you deal kindly with me, confining me to my threadbare cloak and the life of a philosopher. And a man not altogether silly, or madly in love with crowds, might, I think, not blame fortune for confining him in an island, but might even praise her for relieving him from weariness and anxiety, and wanderings in foreign countries. And perils by sea, and the uproar of the forum, and for giving him truly a secure, quiet, undistracted and private life, putting him as it were inside a circle in which everything necessary for him was contained. For what island has not a house, a promenade, a bath, and fish and hares for those who love fishing and field sports? And the greatest blessing, quiet, which others frequently pant for, you can freely enjoy. And whereas in the world, when men are playing at dice or otherwise enjoying the privacy of their homes, informers and busybodies hunt them up and pursue them from their 387 houses and gardens in the suburbs. And drag them by force to the forum and court, in an island no one comes to bother one or done one or to borrow money. Or to beg one to be surety for him or canvas for him. Only one's best friends and intimates come to visit one out of good will and affection. And the rest of one's life is a sort of holy retirement to whoever wishes or has learnt to live the life of leisure. But he who thinks those happy who are always scouring the country, and pass most of their lives in inns and ferryboats, 
is like a person who thinks the planet's happier than fixed stars. And yet every planet keeps its order, rolling in one sphere, as in an island. For, as Heraclitus says, the sun will never deviate from its bounds, for if it did, the Furies, who are the ministers of justice, would find it out. Let us use such and similar language, my friend, and harp upon it, to those who are banished to an island, and are debarred all access with others. By the sea waves, which many keep apart. But you who are not tied down to one spot, but only forbidden to live in one, have by that prohibition liberty to go to all others. Moreover, to the considerations, I am not in office, or a member of the Senate, or an umpire in the games, you may oppose these, I do not belong to any faction, I have no large sums to spend. I have not to dance attendance at the doors of the prefect, it is no odds to me who has got by lot the province, whether he is hot-tempered or an objectionable person. But just as Archilochus overlooked the fruitful fields and vineyards of Thassos, and abused that island as rocky and uneven, and said of it, It stands like donkey's chine, crowned with wild forest. So we, fixing our eyes only on one aspect of exile, its inglorious state, overlook its freedom from cares, its leisure, its liberty. And yet people thought the kings of Persia happy, because they passed their winter in Babylon, their summer in Media, and the pleasant season of spring at Susa. So can the exile be present at the Eleusinian Mysteries, at the festival of Dionysus at Athens, at the Nemean 388 games at Argos, at the Pythian games at Delphi, and can pass on and be a spectator of the Isthmian and Corinthian games. If he is fond of sightseeing. And if not, he has leisure, can walk about, read, sleep without being disturbed, and can say like Diogenes, Aristotle has to dine when Philip thinks fit, Diogenes can dine at any time he himself chooses, having no business, or magistrate, or prefect, to put him out of his general habits of living. And so it is that you will find few of the wisest and most intelligent men buried in their own countries, but most, even without any compulsion, have themselves weighed anchor, and transferred their course, and removed, some to Athens. Some from it. For whoever bestowed such encomium upon his country as Euripides did in the following lines. First we are not a race. Brought in from other parts, but are. Indigenous, when all other cities are. Drops men like, transferred from place to place, and are imported from elsewhere. And, lady, if it is not beside the mark to boast, we have above us a well-tempered sky, a climate not too hot, nor yet too cold. And all the finest things in Greece or Asia we do procure as an attraction here. And yet the author of these lines went to Macedonia, and lived all the latter part of his life at the court of Archelaus. And of course you have heard the following epitaph. Here lies Euphorion's son. Athenian Aeschylus, to whom death came. In corn-producing Jello. For he, like Simonides before him, went to Sicily. And many have changed the commencing words of Herodotus, this is the setting forth of the history of Herodotus of Halicarnassus, into, Herodotus of Thurii. For he migrated to Thurii, and participated in that colony. As to the divine and sacred spirit of the Muses, the poet of the Trojan War, Homer, did not many cities claim him as theirs, because he did not cry up one city only? And hospitable Zeus has many great honors. 389 And if anyone shall say that these pursued glory and honor, go to the philosophers, and their schools and lectures, consider those at the Lyceum, the Academy, the Porch, the Palladium, the Odium. If you admire and prefer the peripatetic school, Aristotle was a native of Stagira, Theophrastus of Erisus, Strato of Lampsicus, Glyco of Troas, Aristo of Ceos, Critolaus of Phaselis. If you prefer the Stoic school, Zeno was a native of Sidium, Cleanthes of Assis, Chrysippus of Soli, Diogenes of Babylon, Antipater of Tarsus. And the Athenian Archidemus migrated to the country of the Parthians, and left at Babylon a succession of the Stoic school. Who exiled these men? Nobody. It was their own pursuit of quiet, of which no one who is famous or powerful can get much at home, that made them teach us this by their practice, while they taught us other things by their precepts. 
And even nowadays most excellent and renowned persons live in strange lands, not in consequence of being expelled or banished, but at their own option, to avoid business and distracting cares. And the want of leisure which their own country would bring them. For it seems to me that the muses aided our old writers to complete their finest and most esteemed works by calling in exile as a fellow worker. Thus Thucydides the Athenian wrote the history of the war between the Peloponnesians and the Athenians in Thrace near the forest of Scapt, Xenophon wrote at Silas in Elis, Philistus in Epirus, Timaeus of Toromenium at Athens. Androtion of Athens at Megara, and Bucalides the poet in Peloponnesus. All these and many more, though exiled from their country, did not despair or give themselves up to dejection, but so happy was their disposition that they considered exile a resource given them by fortune. Whereby they obtained universal fame after their deaths, whereas no memorial is left of those who were factious against them and banished them. He therefore is ridiculous who thinks that any ignominy attaches itself to exile. What say you? Was Diogenes without glory, whom Alexander saw basking in the sun, and stopped to ask if he wanted anything, and when he 390 answered, nothing, but that you would get a little out of my light, Alexander, astonished at his spirit. Said to his friends, If I were not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. Was Camillus without glory when banished from Rome, of which he is now accounted the second founder? And indeed Themistocles did not lose by his exile the glory he had obtained among the Greeks, but he added to it among the barbarians, and there is no one so without honor, so ignoble. Who would prefer to be Leo Bates who indicted him rather than Themistocles the exile, or Clodius who banished Cicero rather than the banished one, or Aristophon the accuser rather than Timotheus who got driven by him from his country? But since a good many are moved by the lines of Euripides, who seems to bring a strong indictment against exile, let us see what it is he says in each question and answer about it. Jocasta. What is to be an exile? Is it grievous? Polynices. Most grievous, and indeed worse than in. Word. Jocasta. What is its aspect? What is hard for exiles? Polynices. This is the greatest, that they have no freedom. Jocasta. This is a slave's life not to speak. One's thoughts. Polynices. Then one. Must put up with one's master's follies. But this is not a right or true estimate. For first of all, not to say out all one thinks is not the action of a slave but of a sensible man, in times and matters that require reticence and silence, as Euripides himself has said elsewhere better. Be silent where tis meet. Speak where tis safe. Then as for the follies of one's masters, one has to put up with them just as much in one's own country as in exile. Indeed, more frequently have the former reason to fear that the powerful in cities will act unjustly to them either through calumny or violence. But his greatest and absurdest error is that he takes away from exiles freedom of speech. It is wonderful, if Theodorus had no freedom of speech, that when Lysimachus the king said to him, Did 391 not your country cast you out because of your character? replied, yes, as Semele cast out Dionysus, when unable to bear him any longer. And when he showed him Telesphorus in a cage, with his eyes scooped out, and his nose and ears and tongue cut off, and said to him, This is how I treat those that act ill to me. And had not Diogenes freedom of speech, who, when he visited Philip's camp just as he was on the eve of offering battle to the Greeks, and was taken before the king as a spy, told him he had come to see his insatiable folly who was going shortly to stake his dominions and life on a mere die. And did not Hannibal the Carthaginian use freedom of speech to Antiochus, though he was an exile, and Antiochus a king? For as a favorable occasion presented itself he urged the king to attack the enemy, and when after sacrifice he reported that the entrails forbade it, Hannibal chided him and said, You listen rather to what flesh tells you than to the instruction of a man of experience. Nor does exile deprive geometricians or grammarians of their freedom of speech, or prevent their discussing what they know and have learnt. Why should it then good and worthy men? It is meanness everywhere that stops a man's speech, ties and gags his tongue, and forces him to be silent. 
But what are the next lines of Euripides? Jocasta. Hopes feed the hearts of exiles, so they say. Polynices. Hopes have a flattering smile, but still. Delay. But this is an accusation against folly rather than exile. For it is not those who have learnt and know how to enjoy the present, but those who ever hang on the future, and hope after what they have not, that float as it were on hope as on a raft, though they never get beyond the walls. Jocasta. But did your father's friends do nothing for you? Polynices. Be fortunate. Friends are no use in trouble. Jocasta. Did not your good birth better your condition? Polynices. Tis bad to want. Birth brought no bread to me. 392 But it was ungrateful in Polynices thus to rail against exile as discrediting his good birth and robbing him of friends, for it was on account of his good birth that he was deemed worthy of a royal bride though in exile. And he came to fight supported by a band of friends and allies, a great force, as he himself admits a little later. Many of the princes of the Danai and from Mycenae are with me, bestowing a sad but necessary kindness on me. Nor was there any more justice in the lament of his mother. I never lit for you the nuptial torch in marriage customary, nor did Ismenus furnish you with the usual solemn bath. She ought to have been pleased and content to hear that her son dwelt in such a palace as that at Argos, and in lamenting that the nuptial torch was not lit, and that he had not had the usual bath in the river Ismenus. As though there was no water or fire at Argos for wedded people, she lays on exile the evils really caused by pride and stupidity. But exile, you will say, is a matter of reproach. It may be among fools who also jeer at the beggar, the bald man, the dwarf, I, and even the stranger and resident alien. But those who are not carried away in that manner admire good men, whether they are poor, or strangers or exiles. Do we not see that all men adore the temple of Theseus as well as the Parthenon and Eleusinium? And yet Theseus was an exile from Athens, though it was owing to him that Athens is now inhabited, and he was banished from a city which he did not merely dwell in, but had himself built. And what glory is left to Eleusis, if we are ashamed of Eumalpus, who migrated from Thrace, and taught the Greeks, as he still teaches them, the mysteries? And who was the father of Codrus that reigned at Athens? Was it not Melanthus, an exile from Messene? And do you not praise the answer of Antisthenes to the person who told him that his mother was a Phrygian, so also is the mother of the gods? If you 393 are twit then with exile, why do you not answer, the father of the glorious victor Hercules was an exile? And Cadmus, the grandfather of Dionysus, when he was sent from home to find Europa, and never came back, though a Phoenician born he changed his country, and migrated to Thebes, and became the grandfather of Dionysus. Who rejoices in the cry of Evo, the exciter of women, who delights in frantic honours. As for what Aeschylus obscurely hints at in the line. Apollo the chaste god, exile. From heaven. Let me keep a religious silence, as Herodotus says. And Empedocles commences his system of philosophy as follows, it is an ordinance of necessity, an ancient decree of the gods, when anyone stains his hands with crime and murder, the long-lived demons get hold of him. So that he wanders away from the gods for thirty thousand years. Such is my condition now, that of an exile and wanderer from the gods. In these words he not only speaks of himself, but points out that all of us men similarly are strangers and foreigners and exiles in this world. For he says, O men, it is not blood or a compounded spirit that made the being or beginning of the soul, but it is your earth-born and mortal body that is made up of these. He calls speciously by the mildest of names the birth of the soul that has come from elsewhere a living in a strange country. But the truth is the soul is an exile and wanderer, being driven about by the divine decrees and laws, and then, as in some sea-girt island, gets joined to the body like an oyster to its shell, as Plato says. Because it cannot call to mind or remember from what honour and greatness of happiness it migrated, 
not from Sardis to Athens, nor from Corinth to Lemnos or Cyros, but exchanging heaven and the moon for earth and life upon earth. If it shifts from place to place for ever so short a time it is put out and feels strange, and fades away like a dying plant. But although one soil is more suitable to a 394 plant than another, and it thrives and grows better on such a soil, yet no situation can rob a man of his happiness or virtue or sense. It was in prison that Anaxagoras wrote his squaring of the circle, and that Socrates, even after drinking the hemlock, talked philosophically, and begged his friends to be philosophers, and was esteemed happy by them. On the other hand, Phaethon and Tantalus, though they got up to heaven, fell into the greatest misfortunes through their folly, as the poets tell us. Euripides, Phoenissae, 388, 389. Reading Beta Alpha Kappa Lambda Alpha. Gallus in Latin. Iliad, 24. 527 to 533. Plato, Timaeus. A. Compare Ovid, Metamorphoses, I, 84 to 86. Derived from mu epsilon tau, gamma epsilon tau omicron mu, because then people flitted and changed their neighbors. Euripides, Iphigenia in Taurus, 253. See also Pausanias, 8. 24. Pindar, Phragm. 126. Aeschylus, Niobe, Phragm. 146. Odyssey, 6. 8. I read New Deltero Nu as Wittenbach. Odyssey, 6. 204. C. Pausanias, v. 6. In our money about 121 pounds 17. 6 d. Iliad, 14. 230. Iliad, 24. 544. Iliad, 9. 668. Iliad, 2. 625, 626. So Reisk. Iliad, 21. 59. Euripides, Phragm. 950. Reisk suggests Beta Alpha Kappa Chi Upsilon Lambda Delta Eta Kappa Epsilon Omicron. A very probable suggestion. Euripides, Phoenissae, 388 to 393. Omitting Pyro Tau Omicron, which probably got in from Pyro Tau Omicron new following, and for which Reisk conjectured Rho. Such as Cardinal Balu was shut up by Louis XI. In for fourteen years. The answer of Theodorus is wanting. Euripides, Phoenissae, 396, 397. That is, they never get any further. Euripides, Phoenissae, 402 to 405. Euripides, Phoenissae, 430 to 432. Ibid, 344 to 346. Reading Chi Theta Omicron Nu. Sic Matandum Senset Valcanarius. Wittenbach. Through his daughter Semele. Herodotus, 2. 171. On Fortune. Fortune, not wisdom, rules the affairs of mortals. And does not justice, and fairness, and sobriety, and decorum rule the affairs of mortals? Was it of fortune or owing to fortune that Aristides persevered in his poverty, when he might have been lord of much wealth? And that Scipio after taking Carthage neither saw nor received any of the spoil? Was it of fortune or owing to fortune that Philocrate spent on harlots and fished the money he had received from Philip? And that Lasthenes and Euthocrates lost Olynthus, measuring happiness by their belly in lusts? Was it of fortune that Alexander the son of Philip not only himself abstained from the captive women, but punished others that outraged them? Was it under the influence of an evil genius and fortune that Alexander, the son of Priam, intrigued with the wife of his host and ran away with her, and filled two continents with war and evils? For if all these things are due to fortune, what hinders our saying that cats and goats and apes are under the influence of fortune in respect of greediness, and lust, and ribaldry? And if there are such things as sobriety and justice and fortitude, with what reason can we deny the existence of prudence, and if prudence exists, how can we deny the existence of wisdom? 
For sobriety is a kind of prudence, 395 as people say, and justice also needs the presence of prudence. Nay more, we call the wisdom and prudence that makes people good in regard to pleasure self-control and sobriety, and in dangers and hardships endurance and fortitude, and in dealings between man and man and in public life equity and justice. And so, if we are to ascribe to fortune the acts of wisdom, let us ascribe justice and sobriety to fortune also, I, and let us put down to fortune stealing, and picking pockets, and lewdness, and let us bid farewell to argument. And throw ourselves entirely on fortune, as if we were, like dust or refuse, borne along and hurried away by a violent wind. For if there be no wisdom, it is not likely that there is any deliberation or investigation of matters, or search for expediency, but Sophocles only talked nonsense when he said. Whatever is sought is found. What is neglected escapes our notice. And again in dividing human affairs. What can be taught I learn. What can be found out duly investigate, and. Of the gods I ask for what is to be got by. Prayer. For what can be found out or learnt by men, if everything is due to fortune? And what deliberative assembly of a state is not annulled, what counsel of a king is not abrogated, if all things are subject to fortune? Whom we abuse as blind because we ourselves are blind in our dealings with her. Indeed, how can it be otherwise, seeing that we repudiate wisdom, which is like plucking out our eyes, and take a blind guide of our lives? Supposing any of us were to assert that seeing is a matter of fortune, not of eyesight, nor of the eyes that give light, as Plato says, and that hearing is a matter of fortune, and not the imbibing of a current of air through the ear and brain. It would be well for us then to be on our guard against the evidence of our senses. But indeed 396 nature has given us sight and hearing and taste and smell, and all other parts of the body and their functions, as ministers of wisdom and prudence. For, it is the mind that sees, and the mind that hears, everything else is deaf and blind. And just as, if there were no sun, we should have perpetual night for all the stars, as Heraclitus says, so man for all his senses, if he had no mind or reason, would be little better than the beasts. But as it is, it is not by fortune or chance that we are superior to them and masters of them, but Prometheus, that is reason, is the cause of this presenting us with bulls, horses, and asses, to ease us of our toil, and serve instead. As Aeschylus says, For as to fortune and natural condition, most of the beasts are better off than we are. For some are armed with horns and tusks and stings, and as for the hedgehog, as Empedocles says, it has its back all rough with sharp bristles, and some are shod and protected by scales and fur and talons and hoofs worn smooth by use. Whereas man alone, as Plato says, is left by nature naked, unarmed, unshod, and uncovered. But by one gift, that of reason and painstaking and forethought, nature compensates for all these deficiencies. Small indeed is the strength of man, but by the versatility of his intellect he can tame the inhabitants of the sea, earth, and air. Nothing is more agile and swift than horses, yet they run for man, the dog is a courageous and high-spirited creature, yet it guards man. Fish is most pleasant to the taste, the pig the fattest of all animals, yet both are food and delicacies for man. What is huger or more formidable in appearance than the elephant? Yet it is man's plaything, and a spectacle at public shows, and learns to dance and kneel. And all these things are not idly introduced, but to the end that they may teach us to what heights reason raises man, and what things it sets him above, and how it makes him master of everything. 397 For we are not good. Boxers, nor good wrestlers, nor yet swift. Runners. For in all these points we are less fortunate than the beasts. But by our experience and memory and wisdom and cunning, as Anaxagoras says, we make use of them, and get their honey and milk, and catch them, and drive and lead them about at our will. And there is nothing of fortune in this, it is all the result of wisdom and forethought. Moreover the labors of carpenters and coppersmiths and house-builders and statue-makers are affairs of mortals, and we see that no success in such trades is got by fortune or chance. 
For that fortune plays a very small part in the life of a wise man, whether coppersmith or house builder, and that the greatest works are wrought by art alone, is shown by the poet in the following lines. All handicrafts men go into. The street. Ye that with fan-shaped baskets. Worship Ergain, Zeus fear-eyed. Daughter. For Ergain and Athene, and not fortune, do the trades regard as their patrons. They do indeed say that Niels's, on one occasion painting a horse, was quite satisfied with his painting in all other respects, but that some foam on the bridle from the horse's breath did not please him, so that he frequently tried to rub it out. At last in his anger he threw his sponge, just as it was, full of colors, at the picture, and this very wonderfully produced exactly the effect he desired. This is the only fortunate accident in art that history records. Artificers everywhere use rules and weights and measures, that none of their work may be done at random and anyhow. And indeed the arts may be considered as wisdom on a small scale, or rather as emanations from and fragments of wisdom scattered about among the 398 necessities of life. As the fire of Prometheus is riddled to have been divided and scattered about in all quarters of the world. For thus small particles and fragments of wisdom, breaking up as it were and getting divided into pieces, have formed into order. It is strange then that the arts do not require fortune to attain to their ends, and yet that the most important and complete of all the arts, the sum total of man's glory and merit, should be so completely powerless. Why, there is a kind of wisdom even in the tightening or slackening of chords, which people call music, and in the dressing of food, which we call the art of cooking, and in cleaning clothes, which we call the art of the fuller. And we teach boys how to put on their shoes and clothes generally, and to take their meat in the right hand and their bread in the left, since none of these things come by fortune, but require attention and care. And are we to suppose that the most important things which make so much for happiness do not call for wisdom, and have nothing to do with reason and forethought? Why, no one ever yet wetted earth with water and then left it, thinking it would become bricks by fortune and spontaneously, or procured wool and leather, and sat down and prayed fortune that it might become clothes and shoes. Nor does anyone getting together much gold and silver and a quantity of slaves, and living in a spacious hall with many doors, and making a display of costly couches and tables, believe that these things will constitute his happiness. And give him a painless happy life secure from changes, unless he be wise also. A certain person asked the general Iphicrates in a scolding way who he was, as he seemed neither a heavy-armed soldier, nor a bowman, nor a targeteer, and he replied, I am the person who rule and make use of all these. So wisdom is neither gold, nor silver, nor fame, nor wealth, nor health, nor strength, nor beauty. What is it then? It is what can use all these well, and that by means of which each of these things becomes pleasant and esteemed and useful, and without which they are useless, and unprofitable and injurious, and a burden and disgrace to their possessor. So Hesiod's Prometheus gives very good advice to Epimetheus, not to receive gifts from 399 Olympian Zeus but to send them back, meaning external things and things of fortune. For as if he urged one who knew nothing of music not to play on the pipe, or one who knew nothing of letters not to read, or one who was not used to horses not to ride, so he advised him not to take office if he were foolish. Nor to grow rich if he were a liberal, nor to marry if likely to be ruled by his wife. For success beyond their merit is to foolish persons a cause of folly, as Demosthenes said, and good fortune beyond their merit is to those who are not sensible a cause of misfortune. A line from Corriman. Better known as Paris. Oedipus Tyrannus, 110, 111. Wittenbach compares Terence, Hutton Timorumenos, 675. Nil tam difficilist, quin quirand investigari posiet. Sophomore, frag. 723. Aeschylus, frag. 180, reading nu tau iota delta omicron upsilon lambda alpha with Reisk and the MSS. Euripides, Aeolus, frag. 27. Homer, Odyssey, 8. 246, 247. Sophomore, Frag. 724. The Worker. 
generally a title of Athene, as Pausanias, I, 24, 3. 17, v. 14, 6. 26, 8. 32, 9. 26, Gataker thinks Kappa Alpha Tau Nu should be expunged. Hercher omits Kappa Alpha Tau Nu Theta Eta Nu Nu altogether. So Hercher after Madvig. C. Pliny, History Nat, XXXV. 36, 20. Hesiod, Works and Days, 86, 87. Olenth, I, 23. The whole of this essay reminds one of the well-known lines of Juvenal, twice repeated, namely, X, 365, 366, and 14. 315, 316. Nullum Newman Hafs, S.I. Sit. Prudentia, Nos T.E., Nos Facimus, Fortuna. Dean K. Loclocamus. Index. Abroadness. Absence, the test of affection. Academy, the. Achilles. Acropolis, statue of Leena in the. Admetus. Adonis. Adultery, the fruit of curiosity. Love of change. Eschines. Aeschylus, quoted or referred to. Aesculapius. Aesop, fables of alluded to. Agamemnon. Agathoclea. Agathocles. Agavi. Agesilaus. Agus. Aglaeanus, her knowledge of eclipses. Ajax. Alceus. Alcestis. Alcibiades. Alcman. Alexander, the Great. Alexinus. Ammonius, Plutarch's master. Amoebius. Amphictions. Anacarsis. Anacreon. Anaxagoras. Anaxarchus. Anger, how to restrain, minus 288. Animals, appeal to, minus 25. Use of. Answers, three different kinds of. Antisyra. Antigonus. Antileon. Antimachus, poet. Antipater. Antipatridas. Antiphanes. Antiphon. Antisthenes. Antony. Anatus. Apelles. Aphrodite. Apollo. Araspes. Arcadio. Arcesilaus. Archelaus. 402 Archidamus, King. Archilochus. Archytas, of Tarentum. Ares. Argus. Aristeus, the Saint Hubert of the Middle Ages. Aristides. Aristippus. Aristo. Aristocrates. Aristogiton. Aristomenes, the hero. Aristomenes, tutor of Ptolemy Epiphanes. Aristonica. Aristophanes. Aristotle. Arisino, sister and wife of Ptolemy Philadelphus. Artemis. Aesopicus. Astriver, story of Athenian. Athene, ornament of. Athene and the satyr. Athene Chalcioecus. Called Ergane. Athenians, oracle given to the. Addis. Augustus. Aulus, famous for earthenware. Bacchus. Barbers, a talkative race. Baxter, Richard, and Plutarch, preface, note. Belestish. Bellerophon. Bessus, story about. Bias. Bion. Bacchus. Books, value of. Boys, not to be overworked. To be taught to speak the truth. Love of. Minus 35. Brasidas. Briarius. Brides, custom of in Boeotia. Custom of Atleptis in Libya. Senus, his change of sex. Caesar, Julius. Callimachus. Callisthenes. Calixinus. Camma, story about. 
Carneades. Cassander. Cassandra. Cato. Sebes. Sophisocrates. Sophisodorus. Ceramicus, at Athens. Cestus of Aphrodite. Charon, son of Plutarch. Charon, and Chironia. Chironia, Plutarch's native place. Chalcis, people of. Chameleon. Character, moral. Childless, paid court to. Chilo. Chrysippus. Cicero. Simon, father of Miltiades. Claudia. Cleanthes. Clearchus. Cleomachus. Cleonice. Clitus. Clodius. Clytemnestra, dream of. Conjugal constancy. Conjugal precepts, minus 84. Contentedness of mind, on, minus 311. Contracts. Corex. Cornelia, sister of Scipio. Correction of servants, minus 281. 403 Crassus. Crates. Creon, his daughter. Crete. Chryso. Croesus. Tesiphon. Curiosity, minus 252. Sibylle. Cyclades. Cynic, story about. Sinusarges, note. Cyrus. Danaeus. Darius. Deity, on those who are punished late by the, minus 365. Demaratus. Demetrius. Democritus. Demosthenes. Diogenes. Dion. Dionysius, the tyrant of Sicily. Dionysius, a Corinthian poet. Dionysus, the Latin Bacchus. Dioxippus. Disease, the sacred, note. Disorders, of mind or body, which worse. Dolan. Domitian. Domitius. Dorian measure. Drink. Dryads. Earthenware. Education, minus 21. Egyptian, answer of an. Emerson, on Plutarch, see title page, and preface, p. 9. Empedocles. Empone, her devotion to her husband, minus 69. Enemies, how a man may be benefited by his, minus 213. Enthusiasm. Envy. On envy and hatred, minus 315. How one can praise oneself without exciting envy, minus 331. Epaminandus. Ephesus. Ephorus. Epicharmus. Epicureans, argued against, minus 28, minus 378. Epicurus. Epitaphs. Erisistratus. Ergain, name of Athene. Eumenes. Euphemism. Euphorian. Eupolis. Euripides, quoted or referred to. Eurydice of Hierapolis. Eurydice, wife of Orpheus. Euthydemus. Eutropio, cook to King Antigonus. Ivinus, sayings of. Exercise, value of. 404 Exile, minus 394. Fabius Maximus. Fabricius. Family, defects and idiosyncrasies of. Fancy, power of. Fathers, not to be too strict. To set a good example to their sons. The just trium liberorum. Saying of Ivinus about fathers. Favor, the. Reminding of favors unpleasant. Feast, every day, a. Fickleness. Flatterers. Saying of Phocian about. How to be discerned from friends, minus 201. Flute girls at marriages. Fortune, not to be railed at, minus 91. Fortune's rope dance. Fortune and vice. On fortune, minus 399. Freedom of speech, minus 201. Friends, on abundance of, 
minus 153. Friendship going in pairs. Originated by similarity. How friends are to be distinguished from flatterers, minus 201. Galba, story about. Geese, ingenuity of. Germanicus, idiosyncrasy of. Glaucus, son of Epicides. Gobrius. Gods considered as forces. Perform their benefits secretly. Gorgias. Gorgo, wife of Leonidas. Gracchus. Great, the, especially open to flatterers. Grief, immoderate at death to be avoided. Unexpected grief worst. Gilippus. Habit, force of. Hannibal, remark of. Happiness, the mind the seat of. Hares. Harmodious. Hatred, and envy, minus 315. Hegesias. Helican, mount. Helots. Hemlock, how affected by wine. Heraclea. Heraclitus. Hercules. Heredity. Hermes, his functions. Proverbial saying about. Herodotus. Herophilus. Herrick, and Plutarch, see preface, note. Hesiod, quoted or alluded to. Hiero. Hieronymus. Hipparchus, dream of. Hippocrates. Hippothorus, a tune. Homer, alluded to or quoted. Hype rides. Hypsipyle, her foster child. 405 Ibicus, story about. Idean dactyli. Ignorance of self. Imagination, power of. Indian wives. Indian sages. Infants, death of. Iolaus, nephew of Hercules. Iphocrates, answer of. Knowledge of self. Labor, its power. Lacida, friend of Arcesilius. Lacida, king of the Argives. Lays, famous courtesan. Law, martial. Leina, her heroism. Lemnos, the women of. Leo of Byzantium, saying of. Life, the three kinds of. Like a game at dice. Checkered. Live unknown, whether a wise precept, minus 378. Litigation, evil effects of. Livia, wife of Augustus. Liver, the seat of desire. Locrians, custom of the. Locris, authorities of. Love, to one's offspring, minus 28. On love generally, minus 69. God of love, his festival at Thespii. Pandemian and celestial love. No strong love without jealousy. Lovers admire even the defects of their loves. Love blind. Loxias, name of Apollo, meaning of. Lysiscus. Lycurgus. Lydiada. Lydian measure. Lydian produce. Lincius. Lysander. Lysias. Lysimachi. Lysimachus, king. Messenus. Magus. Man, his wretchedness. Different views of men. Man's various idiosyncrasies and fortunes. Marriage, minus 39, minus 69. Hesiod on the proper age for marriage. No meum and tuum to exist in marriage. Mutual respect a vital necessity in marriage. Conjugal precepts, minus 84. Marcius. Means, various kinds of. Measures, Dorian and Lydian. Median war. Medius. Megabizus. Megara, wife of Hercules. Megarians, their sacrifice to Poseidon. Melanippus. Melanthius. Meliager. Meletus. Memory, the storehouse of learning. Menander. Menedemus. Metagetian. Metella, wife of Sulla. Metellus. Metricles. Metrodorus, saying of. 
mice, dislike to. Miltiades, the son of Simon. Mirrors of the Ancients, Note. Comparison of Wives to Mirrors. Proper Use of the Mirror. Comparison of the Flatterer to a Mirror. Mithridates. Money, against borrowing, minus 373. 406 Montaigne, and Plutarch, Preface. Mothers, to be carefully selected. To suckle their children. Munichia. Music, power of. Musonius. Nasica, saying of. Nations, most warlike also most amorous. Natures, great. Nielses, story about. Neglect, not liked. Neocles, father of Themistocles. Nero. Nicostratus. Knight, Greek word for. Ninus and Semiramis. Niobe. No, saying. Ochnus. Odysseus, self restraint of. Oedipus. Ennenth. Old Age Querulous. Olympia, remarkable portico at. Olympias, wife of King Philip. Olynthus. Onimodemus, wise advice of. Oratory, extempore and prepared. Laconic oratory. Orpheus. Paley, F. A., on the Moralia, Preface. Pan. Panthea. Parmenides, his cosmogony. Parmenio. Parthian juice. Passions, difference in. Patroclus. Pausanias and Cleonice. Pederasty, see boys, love of. Perfection, not in mortals. Pericles, son of Xanthippus. Perseus. Persia, kings of. Phaethon. Phalaris. Phalus and his wife. Phidias. Philip, king. Philippides, comic poet. Philosophy, its importance. Philosopher's dress. Birthplace of various philosophers. Philotas. Philotimus. Philoxenus. Phocian. Phocylides. Phoenix, tutor of Achilles. Phryne. Phrynus. Pindar. Perithous. Piso, Pupius, story about. Pittacus. Plato. Plutarch's wife, C. Timoxena. Polymo. Polycletus. Polypus, the. Polyspurcan. 407 Pompey, the Great. His father Pompeius Strabo. Portico, remarkable. Porus. Poseidon. Postumia. Praise of Self, minus 331. Proteus. Proverbs. Ptolemy Alites. Ptolemy Epiphanes. Ptolemy Philadelphus. Ptolemy Philippator. Ptolemy Fiscon. Punishment, on those that receive late punishment from the Deity, minus 365. Puppies, differently trained. Pidna. Pyro, saying of. Pythagoras. Pythian Priestess. Reason, power of. Remorse. Repartee. Respites. Rusticus. Rutilius. Sabinus, story about, minus 69. Sappho. Saturnalia, note. Satyr, story about the. Scorus. Salurus, and the bundle of sticks. Scipio. Sejanus. Seleucus Callinicus. Self, love of. Ignorance of. Knowledge of. Semiramis. Senator, story about Roman. Seneca. Sextius. Shyness, minus 267. Silence, benefit of, minus 222, minus 232. Simonides. Sinatus. Sinorix. Socrates. Solon.
His Legislation for Husbands His Direction to Brides Sophocles, Quoted or Referred to Sotades Spusippus, Nephew of Plato Stepladders Stepmothers, Note Stilpo Stoics Stratacles Suicide, Always Possible Sulla Sycophant, Origin of Word Talkativeness, minus 238. Tantalus. Tavern Frequenting, Note. Taylor, Jeremy, and Plutarch, Preface, Note, Note, Note. Note. Telephus. Tenidos, Famous for Earthenware. Theano, Wife of Pythagoras. 408 Thebans, and Lacedaemonians. Themistocles, and his son. His father Neocles. Themistocles and Miltiades. Suspicion about. Sayings of. Theocritus, the sophist. Theodorus. Theognus, his advice. Theophrastus. Thero, the Thessalian. Theseus. Thespesius, of Soli, curious story about, minus 365. Thessalians, very pugnacious. Note. Thessaly, famous for enchantments. Note. Thucydides. Tiberius. Timia. Timesias, oracle given to. Timoleon. Timon. Timotheus. Timoxena, wife of Plutarch, consolatory letter to, minus 92. Timoxena, daughter of Plutarch, minus 92. Tongue, government of the, minus 238. Barricaded by nature. Training, power of, minus 7. Triptolemus. Truth, a divine thing. Tutors, choice of, minus 7. Habits they teach boys. Versatility. Vespasian. Vice, not got rid of as easily as a wife. Uneasiness of. Whether it is sufficient to cause unhappiness, minus 142. Vice in embryo. Virtue, its two elements. Can be taught, minus 95. On virtue and vice, minus 98. On moral virtue, minus 118. On progress in virtue, minus 138. Washing hands usual before dinner. Wealth, has wings. Wives, to be carefully selected. Rich wives. Indian wives. Words, winged. Wittenbach, his criticism on Reisk, preface. Xantippe, wife of Socrates. Xanthippus, father of Pericles. Xenocrates. Xenophanes. Xenophon. Note. Xerxes. Youth. A ticklish period of life. Seleucus. Zeno, founder of the Stoics. Zuxus, his remark on painting. Chiswick Press, C. Whittingham and Co., Tooks Court, Chancery. Lane. 